It consisted of 20 155 millimeter high explosive artillery shells, a quarter metric ton of TNT, and 500 gallons of diesel fuel. And it was essentially rammed through our gate. My room was completely engulfed in flames. And the very first thought that, that crossed my mind was, you mother effers. It, it, was, it was surprise, anger, and you know, confusion kind of all mashed into one. And I knew one thing, I needed to get the hell out of my room because it was a raging inferno and I was in it. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit and I served war zone tours as an army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15 year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we hear a remarkable combat story from longtime Special Forces Green Beret and 18 Delta medic Ryan Neal. Spent close to 25 years in the Army, most of that in special operations to include nine deployments to Iraq, Afghanistan, and Kosovo. We spent a lot of time on Ryan's combat experiences in this episode, starting right away with the story of how Ryan nearly died on his first deployment to Iraq. I found Ryan through Daryl Utt, who many will recall from our interview number 74 on Combat Story. Uh, Daryl was also a former Green Beret alongside Ryan. Oddly enough, both Daryl and Ryan share the same alive day as they both nearly died on the same day in April 2005. Daryl described the event for Ryan's alive day in the following way. Ryan was 15 meters away when a tanker truck rammed through the gate, detonated 500 gallons of diesel fuel, 20 155 millimeter HE artillery shells, and a quarter metric ton of TNT. Despite having multiple types of injuries and being trapped in his room while it was on fire for two minutes, his teammates kicked the door down, and after a quick self-assessment in only a set of Ranger panties, he proceeded to provide medical treatment to four SF brothers, two interpreters, three Peshmerga guards, he reset their security perimeter and directed Iraqi and U.S. reinforcements. And yes, he has the actual terrorist video footage of the attack, which we show on our YouTube video. Ryan provides a very real and honest perspective of what 15 years of combat like this does to a person and a family, and I am sure so many people will connect with his feelings and perspective. I hope you enjoy this one with someone from 10th Group who lived the Special Forces experience as much as I did. Ryan, thanks so much for taking the time to share your story with us today. Thank you very much for having me. Um, it's it, it's an honor to have this uh, this platform to be able to speak. The honor is all mine, and I wanted to start with how we connected, and it was through uh, Daryl Ut, who a lot of listeners will recall, another former Green Beret. You are are friends with, obviously. Um, he's also helping uh, create this National Medal of Honor Museum incredible work, but he's just really tied in to the veteran community and he posts quite a bit on LinkedIn. And um, one of his posts was about his alive day and it happened to coincide with yours. So I was hoping we could start maybe with what is an alive day and um, what was your relationship with Daryl, just so we can kind of get that to set the stage. So uh, Daryl and I were were both in the same battalion, uh, 2nd Battalion, 10th Special Forces Group. Uh, for you know a, a period of time that overlapped, uh, it was during you know the the quote unquote early days of uh, the the Iraq War, and uh, he was in an, another company. But you know, uh, being as, as things are, you know we you know crossed paths. We were on jumps together, uh, you know various events for the unit. And, uh, you know, oftentimes heard, you know, radio traffic of, of operations that were going on throughout the theater. Uh, so, you know, that, that's my connection with Daryl. And, you know, you mentioned LinkedIn. Um, you know, I, I happened to be looking at LinkedIn one morning and uh, I, I saw uh, Daryl's Alive post. And, um, you know, Alive Day is, is uh, you know, that day that you were almost not alive. Uh, you were almost killed. Uh, you know, it could be in combat. It could be, you know, just in in the the, the course of your civilian life. But it's a, a very significant event that you know really kind of changes and changes your your outlook and your your perceptions on things. Um, so I was you know looking at LinkedIn uh, one morning and and um, you know it was right around the the mid April time frame 
and Daryl was talking about his alive day and it, um, it jogged my memory that, you know, my alive day was, uh, April 14th of 2005. Um, on that day at 655 in the morning, uh, my ODA team house in Tikrit, Iraq, uh, right off of Highway 1, across the, the highway from FOB Danger, uh, was attacked by a suicide vehicle improvised explosive device. Um, I, was, I was in bed. Um, I was hitting my snooze button. I was going to go downstairs and link up with two of my teammates, and we were going to you know, go to the gym and, and uh, get a, a morning workout. And um, my, my uh, hitting the snooze probably saved my life. Uh, number one, uh, because I was in bed and because of my positioning, even though I was uh, pretty much in front of one of the windows that was head on to the explosion, um, I was I had a little bit of defilade. So um, that essentially is what what saved my life. Um, it was determined by the Army Corps of Engineers that came and surveyed the uh, the, the the blast uh, crater, as well as did some analysis on the building. Uh, and we also got intel from uh, when we conducted some later missions uh, to capture the individual that actually uh, carried out the final planning and the execution of the operation. Uh, it consisted of uh, 20 155 millimeter high explosive artillery shells, a quarter metric ton of TNT and 500 gallons of diesel fuel. And it was essentially uh, driven, uh, rammed through our gate. And I remember hearing a couple of pops from an AK. And then, you know, in my mind, you know, still trying to kind of get the last couple of winks of sleep, I remember thinking, oh, well, you know, that's just our Peshmerga guard. You know, somebody looked at him cross-eyed, you know, they were just taking pop shots, you know, warning, warning people to, you know, keep their distance. A um, couple seconds went by and it, it uh, I heard a loud bang. And all of a sudden it changed from, you know, just single, single shots to full auto, a full auto burst. And I remember thinking to myself, well, that's, that's not normal. You know, we've, we've never heard that. Uh, and it immediately afterwards, there was the blast. Um, and, you know, if you, if you remember that, that movie with Keanu Reeves, um, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, um, I, where, where he's walking through hell. And there's the flames just swirling around and everything. That's what I opened my eyes to. Um, my room was completely engulfed in flames. And the very first thought that, that crossed my mind was, you mother effers, you know? I, I just, you know, I, it, it, was, it was surprise, anger, and you know, confusion kind of all mashed into one at the same time. And I knew one thing, I needed to get the hell out of my room uh, because it was a raging inferno and I was in it. Um, so I, uh, you know, kind of, I think I was already standing up. I think, you know, the blast force had kind of launched me up out of my bed. And I remember, you know, crawling over the, the splintered wood, the, you know, burning hot metal uh, glass and everything uh, that now comprised my, my room. And I, I went to the, the, the door to get out and the, the structure of, of the, the building had actually shifted a bit and it had essentially wedged the, the solid wood door completely closed. Um, I, I couldn't open it. And with the adrenaline that was flowing through me, I actually ripped the door handle out of the door and it didn't budge. And so, you know, I was, I was sitting there, uh, well, standing there kind of hunched over because the smoke was starting to, you know, come down uh, in, in the room and uh, make it really difficult to breathe. And so I, I started pounding on the door and, you know, yelling as loud as I could, um, you know, help you know, get me out. I'm, I'm alive. 
And, um, you know, my, my room also as a side note, um, doubled as the, the, the team house aid station. So, you know, I had, I had loads, shelves of, of, of medical equipment. Um, I had four D cell, uh, oxygen, uh, tanks in my room, um, which, you know, when, when those get hot, uh, they, they explode very violently. So I was keenly aware of that fact. Uh, I was also aware of the fact that immediately on the outside of my, uh, the room to my door, there was a, a small hallway that had a stairwell that went up, uh, to the roof. There was like the, a little kind of enclosed parapet, if you will, that, you know, exited out onto the roof. And we, we had a Mark 19 on top of that to provide, you know, fields of fire and visibility, but the ammunition and everything was essentially stored, you know, uh, along the, uh, the, you know, walkway uh, above that hallway. And we had some additional, you know, frags, uh, AT4s and, and other uh, munitions, you know, immediately outside my room. And so I knew it was absolutely imperative that that I get the hell out of there uh, very quickly before I was consumed uh, by flames or, uh, you know, all of that material detonated. Um, needless to say, uh, my my cries were heard and um, one of my teammates came and, and kicked the door in. Uh, and and I just remember, you know, taking a couple steps out uh, of the room, out of the flames and the smoke. And I, I, I just kind of looked at him, another teammate of mine came up and I looked at him and, you know, they, they were looking at me like, holy hell, like how, how, and how did you survive that? Um, you know, I, obviously I, you know, I, I looked, um, fairly bad. Uh, I, I was hit in the head by a piece of shrapnel, um, that, um, uh, you know, essentially made. Uh, this portion of my head looked like a uh, baseball had been cut in half and, and glued to my head. Um, you know, on top of that, um, you know, I, I was in bed. So um, all I had on were ranger panties, uh, you know, the small, you know, the short, silky <laughs> black shorts. And um, I, I had I had burns, you know, on my arms uh, from, you know, some of the burning, uh, you know, oil and fuel and whatnot. Um, I was, I was peppered with, uh, shrapnel, you know, glass, wood, metal. Um, and so, you know, I, I looked a little rough and, um, I just remember looking at, at both of them and they were like, you know, are, are you okay? Like, are, are you all right? And I, I just remember a, a, a moment of clarity where I looked at him and I was like, yeah, I'm fine. Now I got to go to work. Because at the time, uh, I was the only medic on my team. And I knew that if what I just experienced was, you know, uh, in, encompassing of the entire house, uh, then there, there were no doubt additional, you know, injuries and, and casualties need to be treated. So um, I, I, I crossed through, through that, that small hallway into the main hallway which was completely littered with, you know, more glass shards and, and sharp metal and wood wood that was splintered. And I was barefoot this entire time. I was going to ask, yes, yeah, so you have no boots on. You got no, no boots, no shoes. I only had a pair of Ranger panties on. And um, I, I made it halfway down that hallway before both of my teammates stopped me. And they were like, bro, you, you're walking in glass you, you need to get some shoes or something. I was, you know, I kind of, you know, humorously, you know, looked at him and I was like, well, all my, all my crap is, is burnt, you know? So, uh, one of them, you know, went into one of our other teammates rooms and, uh, grabbed some flip-flops, uh, you know, very flimsy, you know, shower shoes that you'd buy at the PX. And, um, I put those on and, and proceeded to, you know, go down the rest of the way, uh, to the, to the main floor of the house. And, um, I grabbed my aid bag, uh, and I, I began treating, uh, my team sergeant, uh, who had taken some shrapnel, uh, as well. Uh, I treated him, 
uh, I treated three of our interpreters. Um, and then I, I checked on um, two uh, other teammates uh, that were injured uh, from, you know, mainly the, the concussion uh, and the blast force, uh, the energy that traveled through the, the house. And, um, and then I, I essentially told uh, my team sergeant, my team leader, and our, our 18 Fox Intel Sergeant, you know, hey, I'm, I'm going outside to, to check on our PESH and anybody else that may be injured. And so I, I remember um, trying to walk out and again, they stopped me. They were like, hey, you, you know, at least throw some body armor on. So I, um, I, um, I had Ranger panties, um, you know, $2 shower shoes, uh, my, my body armor, uh, my large, uh, you know, London, London bridge, uh, aid bag and my rifle. And I proceeded to, you know, go out, out the house. Uh, I had to go right past the, uh, the blast crater, um, which was also adjacent to our ammunition supply point, uh, where all the munitions were cooking off, you know, the five, five, six, the seven, six, two, the 50 cal, uh, the 40 Mike, Mike. Um, thankfully none of the, uh, the AT fours or anything went off. Um, but I, I had to actually, um, kind of crawl my way through, uh, the concertina wire that was now just everywhere, uh, in order to go around the, the, uh, ammo supply point or ASP, um, safely in order to get to, uh, a couple more of our, our Peshmerga guards that were, were wounded. And um, so I, I went and um, I provided the, the initial treatment for them. And um, uh, around that time, we, we started getting um, support from the, the, the local Iraqi police, uh, the Iraqi fire department, the Tikrit fire department, uh, as well as uh, some US uh, conventional forces supporting. Uh, coming from the birthday palace, Saddam's birthday palace, which was across town, as well as some of the uh, elements that were across the street on uh, FOB danger. Um, did they follow this up with any other waves of attack? Was it just, it, it was the VBIED? Yeah, so it was, it was just the SV bid. Um, and, you know, I'm, I, you know, none of us are, are quite sure if there was a um, a follow-on attack that was planned uh, or anything, but, uh, you know, between the, the, the quick actions uh, of, you know, my team leader, my 18 Fox uh, and myself, we were able to, you know, redistribute uh, security, uh, get our Peshmerga guards focused. And then, you know, as, as it developed more uh, with additional, you know, conventional forces coming, we were able to expand the perimeter uh, secure it definitively, and then, you know, begin the, the activities to uh, sterilize and, uh, you know, retrieve, uh, you know, this, the sensitive material uh, that we had. Um, but at, at no point uh, in, in any of it did, did we vacate the, uh, the premises um, or, you know, lose presence. Uh, yeah. We made it a point to maintain our presence there and you know basically let um to weed while jihad which was the al-qaeda aligned uh organization twj uh that uh they failed and we were there to stay and we were coming to get them that's incredible i've got just several questions ryan like this this is pretty amazing. Just a quick word from our sponsor, and we'll get right back to this combat story. As you know, I live in California where we can have earthquakes and fires, and I grew up in Florida with hurricanes. I know firsthand how natural disasters can quickly and unexpectedly put me and my family in a position where we have to hunker down, shelter in place, and sometimes without power, so I always want to have food available. You can create your own stockpile of the best-selling Four Patriots Survival Food Kits. It's not ordinary food. We're talking good for 25 years super survival food. Hand picked right in a family-owned facility in the U.S., giving jobs to over 200 Americans, which we love. The kits are compact, sturdy, water-resistant, and stack easily. They have different delicious 
nutritious breakfasts, lunches, and dinners, and you can make these meals in less than 20 minutes. Just add boiling water, simmer, and serve. And right now, you can go to 4 and use the code COMBAT to get 10% off your first purchase on anything in the store, including their three-month survival kit. You'll get their famous guarantee for an entire year after your order, plus free shipping on orders over $97. They're called 4 Patriots because a portion of every sale is donated to charities who support our veterans and their families. Just go to 4 and use COMBAT to get 10% off. That's the number 4, Patriots.com. Use the code COMBAT and start building your own stockpile today. And now, back to this combat story. I, I did want to say, <clears throat> one of the things you and I talked about before we hit play was, or hit record, was, you know, obviously you you haven't talked about a lot of this stuff openly. You know, you, you mentioned it on oh. LinkedIn. And actually, one of the things that really surprised me was that you and Daryl have known each other for so long and didn't even realize how close you were when this happened. You know, yeah. like we rarely talk about these events out loud, even with our own family. And it's it's amazing another guy in your unit wouldn't necessarily know that this happened because this is just another day. But the reason I bring it up is, um, I think a lot of people, the first time they're talking about this, they're just explaining what happened the same way you just did, very yeah. nonchalant. Um, and I just want people to know, like, there's nothing about this where you're trying to say, like, hey, look at me. I'm, I know I, I am going to pull this out of you. Like, just hearing that you you were in this inferno and then walked out and started treating people um, just begs so many questions. And not everybody would do that, but I, I think... You know, obviously you did. So I, I just want to make sure people hear that from me, that I know yeah. you're not trying to say that. Well, you know, if if I could, you know, expand yeah. on that a bit, um, you know, I, 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 I haven't really spoken, um, you know, very openly about, you know, this experience or, um, you know, really any of my other experiences that, you know, some of which we'll, we'll touch on further in the call, um, you know, out, outside of, you know, my, my brothers in arms that, that I experienced it with, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, um, you know, I, I graduated high school, um, and, you know, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do in school. Um, uh, you know, my, both my parents were, were, you know, PhDs. Uh, my dad has a PhD in botany. Um, my my mom had, had a uh, a PhD in chemistry. Um, my dad was a college professor. Uh, my mom was a college professor, and then became a, a high school uh, science teacher. Um, and and so you know, education, college, you know that that standard route was, you know, I, I don't know, I, I don't really want to say expected of me, but you know, I I sat down one night and. And I, I kind of lined out, you know, what are, what are my options? You know, do I go to school? Do I go to, you know, college just to go to college, go through the motions? Um, or do I, do I do something else? And, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I would hope, you know, uh, quite a few um, of our youth do that, you know, um, in order to, you know, figure things out. But uh you know, one of the things that, that came to mind was, um, you know, John F. Kennedy's favorite, famous statement of, you know, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And, you know, as I developed this quad chart of options and, you know, what I could do, what I, you know, what the benefits were, the, the, the you know, pitfalls, whatnot, um, you know, I, I, I landed on service. And, um, you know, I, I thought it was a, a responsible thing, um, you know, one, as a, as a citizen, um, as, a, as a member of, you know, our collective community, um, to do something that was positive um, and also provide me, you know, uh, uh, an income and, and to have time and space to really figure out, you know, what it is I wanted to do, what I, what I liked, you know, what my passions were. And, you know, as, as my career went on and I had these experiences and whatnot, um, you know, like, like you said, you know, they, they're just, they were just par for the course. They were just, you know, um, 
things that you do. I mean, you know, if, if you, if you run a, a septic business, you know, you're, you're gonna, you're getting, get into some crap and, you know, it's, it's just occupational hazard. And, you know, that's, that's very much how, how I viewed my, my entire career. You know, nobody was forcing me to do it. I raised my right hand, you know, multiple times, uh, volunteering for, you know, increased, um, responsibility, increased, um, you know, positions, um, within special operations. And, you know, th those were conscious decisions and, um, you know, you, you just, I, I don't, I don't think there's really necessarily anything special per se about myself or, you know, my actions. I was just simply a guy that was, was put into a position and had to act. I, I, I have to imagine as you're treating these people on that day, um, instincts just got to take over, you know, as an 18 Delta and, and, but they, they must've just looked at you like, who's this guy in his ranger panties working on me right now? Sexiest guy around. I can't believe I'm <laughs> well, alive. Oh. Well, my teammates, um, you know, they, 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 they probably weren't thinking that, but uh, you know, and, and, and quite frankly, you know, <laughs> we, we, we really didn't, you know, discuss too much, you know, it was just, you know, that happened and, you know, Hey, we're, we're, we're all still here. So, you know, who do you high five and, you know, cheers. Um, <laughs> But, you know, the, the guys across the street uh, on, on FOB Danger, um, there was a, a, a triple canopy uh, crew that was there. Triple canopy uh, was a company. Um, they did PSD work for the State Department and whatnot. And, um, you know, coincidentally, uh, two members of that triple canopy team across the street uh, went through the Q course at the same time that, that I did. Um, oh, wow. they were both national guard guys. Um, and you know, one of them, um, he was, I, I can't remember exactly what his, um, uh, you know, MOS was, if he was a, a 18 Charlie or an 18, uh, Bravo, but, uh, one of them, uh, was an 18 Delta and he was an actual classmate of mine. We went through the entire, uh, you know, uh, special forces medical sergeant course together. And, um, you know, it was, it was interesting, you know, from that perspective to hear from them later. And, uh, I actually have the, uh, the video footage from them, uh, that they took, uh, in the aftermath. And, um, it's, it's kind of funny in, in retrospect, because, you know, you can see me, you know, kind of coming out of the house and, you know, in my flip-flops and ranger panties and body armor and my rifle, you know, navigating through the the concertina wire and the burning vehicles and our asp that was you know cooking off um it was it was interesting yeah. one thing that came to mind because you I, i'm really glad you mentioned hey the first thing i was thinking was wtf you know a little bit of anger revenge frustration correct me if i'm wrong on this one ryan but you're married and have a kid at that time is that right Yes, that's correct. So this, uh, this was April 14th of 2005. My wife and I actually got married, uh, August 24th of 2002. Uh, it was, it was right as I was leaving, uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Uh, I, I had been there from 1996 to, till that point. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we got married and, um, we, we, our, our son was born, uh, while I was, uh, at the very tail end of the, uh, the actual medic course. Uh, and you know, there, there was a lot of drama there as well, uh, and, and stress. Our, our son was born 10 and a half weeks premature. Uh, he only weighed two pounds, seven ounces, and, uh, he had a grade three, uh, brain bleed. And so, you know, going through the Q course, uh, you know, the, the medical course is, is stressful in and of itself. Um, and I, you know, then had that added to on top of, you did know, they let you, did they let you spend time out of the course? They, they did. They were, they were actually, um, That's good. really good about it. Um, you know, he was in the NICU, uh, there, uh, on Fort Bragg, uh, at Womack, uh, for about two and a half months. Uh, they would not release him from the hospital until he was, I, I want to say, over five pounds. And so, 
you know, my, at, at that point, my wife and I, uh, you know, had a discussion of, okay, what, what do I do? Do I, you know, kind of pull myself from training, you know, talk to the student detachment and the cadre and, uh, you know, pull myself out for a, a little bit of a pause so that we can figure out things, um, knowing full well that I'm going to want to jump back in and, you know, get back to it, um, which, you know, would would separate me from from the individuals, my classmates that I'd been, you know, um, a part of, you know, the the entirety of the training up until that point. Or do I just continue on um, so that we can get out of Fort Bragg and, and you know, get to wherever, um, you know, as quickly as possible? So, uh, you know, my wife and I decided that I was going to stay stay in the course and I wasn't going to take a knee. And uh, so, you know, I, I didn't see my son um, until, shoot, I want to say probably the beginning uh, beginning to middle of March, um, when, when I finished Robin Sage, um, I had only seen him in the hospital and I, I had only held him, you know, a handful of times, but yes, you're, you're correct. I mean, you know, had a, had a brand new, brand new baby. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was a lot to deal with. Yeah. I I mean, I'm going to circle back to what I, what I wanted to ask in a second, but I did want to say that that experience you just relayed isn't, it doesn't happen to everyone, but it's not uncommon in this world we operated in where when I was at the CIA, um, some people who've listened to this have heard me say this once or twice before, but my, I was at the farm for our training course and I had our third son was born there in our last month of training. And I got to come home for like a day and he was early in the NICU not as, not as early as, as your son was, but still you feel like, oh my God, am I going to like miss if he's here? Like, what if something happens to him? And and my wife and I had a discussion. It it was probably, you make it sound more cordial. Ours was, my wife goes, you better go back. And if you fail that course, I'm going to kill you. You pass that damn course or I'm going to be so pissed. And it was, it was good motivation. It was like, all right, I got it. I'm going to go back and, and finish this. But yeah. Back your mind, you still got a kid who's in a NICU, you know, like it's not, it's not yeah. easy. No, no, it wasn't. And, you know, um, I'm sure later on, you know, we'll, we'll talk about some other things, but, you know, I, 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 I think, you know, that that's also part of, you know, our DNA, uh, you know, yeah. you know, within special operations and, you know, the agency and, and whatnot, you know, it's, we, we compartmentalize very well. Um, and, you know, we, we do what we, we need to do, uh, so that we can, we can stay in the fight. We can, we can stay relevant to, you know, our brothers to our left and our right. Um, and you know, it, 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 it does become a diff- difficult balancing act. And, you know, at some point, you know, the, those roosters do come, come to roost. Yeah. So I was wondering when you mentioned that you're in this blast on your live day, at what point, if at all, does your wife or your son come to your mind? Is it after everything's calmed down? Yeah, well, that's it's a really difficult question to to answer. Um, you know, I, I think I think you know first and foremost there was there was uh, you know a sense of self preservation. You know, I I, I got to get out of here. Um, you know, how you complete the end of that sentence, you know, for what or who, for who, um, you know, obviously in, in the here and now it was, I got to get out of the room so I can survive and assist in, you know, treating injured and, you know, getting us out of this shit. Um, and then, you know, at another level, it was, you know, I, I got to get out of here so that, you know, I, I can make it home. Um, I don't really think the, the, the true magnitude of, you know, how close I came to death really, you know, hit me until, you know, I, I would probably say days later, 
um, you know, and, you know, the, the interesting thing about the, the way that my wife was notified, um, I, I think it was really wrong. I mean, my wife and I have actually, you know, kind of touched on this uh, somewhat recently. Um, I had a really interesting company commander at the time. Um, and there were some really interesting family dynamics that he had going on uh, with, with his, his wife. And, um, and it was actually his wife that called my wife and, you know, she, she prefaced the call with, you know, I hope you're sitting down because what I got to tell you is like really bad. Yes. And, you know, not, not necessarily, you know, the, I, I guess in the medical profession, you'd call it bedside manner. Yeah. Um, and, you know, she proceeded to tell my wife that, you know, there was a very large explosion. Uh, Ryan's team house was, you know, bombed, um, you know, it was destroyed, whatever. And, um, you know, there was injuries, Ryan was injured. And, you know, she didn't have the details. She shouldn't have been the one to communicate that. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, that in some way, shape or form, you know, planted a seed with her, um, you know, that kind of grew over the years, um, you know, with a little bit of animosity, you know, towards, uh, you know, the unit, the profession, you know, my career, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. That is tough, man. Uh, and early on in the war still, I mean, 05, a couple of years in, but yeah. God. And I feel like we were just learning so much at that time. Hopefully that stuff didn't continue, but I'm sure there are stories like that. Where... Yeah. Unfortunately, um, you know, I've, I've, I've got a, another story that I, that I can relay later in the call, um, you know, that, that touches on, you know, notification and, yeah. and um, you know, the, the narrative that, that, you know, accompanies that notification. Um, but we can get into that. Okay. Well, I guess one of the things I wanted to touch on, I love the fact that when you were making your decision on what to do in your life, you made a quad chart, which I feel like pretty <laughs> much ensured you were going to the army. I don't know if you did it on a PowerPoint slide or what, but no, cool. no, it wasn't on a PowerPoint. It was all hand jammed. And, uh, you know, may maybe it's because, you know, like I said, you know, both my my parents, uh, you know, were educators. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was interesting. And, you know, the, the other funny thing is, um, I actually didn't, you know, contact or call the, the army recruiter. Um, you know, I, I, I contacted, well, I'm sorry. I, I originally had the idea that I wanted to be force recon. I wanted to be a Marine, you know, I wanted to have the, the camo and, you know, the boonie hat and, you know, do all that snooping and pooping behind enemy lines. And um, so I, I couldn't find the, uh, the, the number to the Marine recruiter. So I, uh, I, I called the army recruiter and I was like, Hey, uh, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if you can give me the number to the Marine recruiter. Well, that's all he had to hear. And, uh, you know, he's like, well, why don't you come in and talk to me and I'll tell you everything that the army can provide you. So, you know, I said, OK, what the hell? Um, went to the recruiter's office. You know, um, I'd already taken the ASVAB. I mean, I don't even know if that's, you know, a requirement anymore for high schoolers nowadays. But, you know, I took the ASVAB. So I had my GT score. I took a, you know, a, some other test uh, there at the recruiting office and, um, you know, got to the end of that. And the recruiter was like, who happened to be an MP, uh, with a very inappropriate, uh, tattoo prominently displayed on his forearm of a naked, uh, like tiki girl or something like that. Um, you know, this is the nineties. So, yeah. um, so anyways, he, he was like, all right, Hey bro. Like, uh, you can, you can pretty much do any job in the army, you know, like all the cool Intel stuff, you know, all the, you know, desk stuff, like, you know, what do you want to do? And, you know, I just kind of sat there thinking, you know, looking at the list and kind of looking around the office at the posters. And, and I saw this poster that was on the wall of, of these uh, two snipers from, from Ranger Battalion. And, uh, you know, they were, they were in a tree, they were all gillied up and whatnot. And I was like, that's what I want to do. And uh, I mean, 
the dude looked at me like I was absolutely nuts. And um, I was like, yeah, seriously, like, that's what I want to do. And so, you know, we, we looked around for a, for a, uh, a ranger contract. Uh, there weren't any at the time. And, you know, I got the standard, well, uh, I got an 11 x-ray contract for you. And when you're down at, at uh, basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, for, you know, one station unit training, they're going to come around and they're going to ask who wants to go to, who wants to go to RASP. Uh, and uh, I was like, all right, yeah, sure. Cool. Uh, so that, that's, yeah. that's uh, essentially how I, how I became a, uh, an 11 Bravo. <laughs> Thank you. That was light infantry. Um, Cause at the time, you know, they still had, um, Oh, what was it? The 11 hotels, the tow missile gunner. Oh yeah. yeah. Humvees and uh, 11 Mike, uh, you know, so I was very, very glad that I, I became an 11 Bravo and uh, went to Fort Campbell, Kentucky as a member I, of the, uh, the Rock Sons. I got to say, first of all, there's got to be some Marine recruiter from the 90s who <laughs> listens to this and is just like, what? We didn't <laughs> have our number there. He's probably like calling up some old uh, recruiter yeah. in town um, and good good on the, the Army guy. A couple questions on this. Number one, um, how did your parents re- receive this idea that you were going to go into the military, given how educated they, they were? Well, so, um, you know, I, I was previously referring to my mother in past tense. Um, and, and that's because my, my mother, uh, passed away, uh, in a car accident, uh, when I was about nine years old. Um, and in, in that car accident, my, my grandfather, uh, was killed instantly, uh, her, her father, and uh, my grandmother, um, you know, the, the nature of her injuries and whatnot uh, rapidly accelerated her, her decline uh, from Alzheimer's. Uh, she passed away a, a couple of years after that uh, in hospice. Um, but, you know, my, my dad remarried a, a couple of years after that. And, um, you know, I, I guess, you know, looking back on it, my, my, my parents, uh, you know, my dad and my, my stepmom, um, they were supportive uh, of my decision. Um, they they understood my my rationale uh, of you know not just simply going to to college and you know racking up debt and you know not knowing what I wanted to do. Um, you know, interestingly enough, I I recently uh, uh, spent some time with my father for his 79th birthday. Um, I was I'm I'm fortunate enough to be able to have. Um, uh, you know, coordinated uh, and, um, and and paid for a, a week-long vacation uh, to uh, Lake Tahoe. And my dad, still at 79, is an avid skier. And, um, you know, I grew up skiing, you know, downhill racing, slalom, giant slalom. Um, and uh, so we were able to go out there and, and uh, spend some good time on the slopes. Uh, he's still doing blacks. That's amazing, man. 79. Uh, at 79, yeah. Wow. Um, but, uh, you know, I spoke to my dad about his college experience and, uh, you know, he, he spent, you know, essentially 10 years in, in <laughs> college, uh, five years, uh, in undergraduate and then, uh, five years in a, a PhD program. Um, interesting, interesting note, uh, his PhD thesis, uh, is the very reason why when you see trees, uh, newly planted in developments or, you know, new construction, uh, there are three um, stakes with the the wires or the strings to provide support. My dad was the one that actually determined that um, that was the best method of uh, planting trees and ensuring their survival by providing enough support uh, so that the tree, uh, you know, doesn't fall over, but at the same time, not providing too much support to the tree so that its roots don't go down deep and, you know, stabilize itself as it grows. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they were, they were both they supportive. Were supportive and, uh, and, and they understood, you know, because I was able to, I was able to show them the, you know, the tick and tack of, of my thought process. I also think it's interesting the way you described not just wanting to be recon because you probably saw maybe a poster or a commercial or something, but when asked like, Hey, what do you want to do? And obviously we're, we're young at that time, not knowing that this decision is going to like 
create so many forks in the road for us. But you're like, what posters on the wall? Go do that. That looks cool. You know yeah. how influenced we are by this. There's so many people I interview. It's a book. It's a poster. It's a movie um, that really just, it's like, hey, that's what I want to go do. It's amazing. Yeah. You know, I was, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say I was, you know, enamored with the military. Um you know, to be quite honest, you know, I, I really didn't know much about the military. Um, you know, my, uh, my, my father never served my, my, uh, my mother never served, um, you know, but, you know, in the sense of military service, I mean, obviously they, yeah. they serve their communities sure. in, in the larger community, you know, by, by being educators. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't really know much about it. I, I knew my, my, um, my, my dad's dad, my grandfather, uh, who I never met, um, had been in, in the army. He was in the signal Corps, um, 82nd airborne. Uh, I believe he did, did some time in, in Europe as well as North Africa during world war II. Um, but you know, beyond that, um, you know, I, I watched Rambo, you know, growing up as a kid and I thought it was pretty badass. Um, but you know, I, I was more drawn to, you know, the, the, the physical side of things, yeah. the, you know, the physical aspects, uh, you know, I, I grew up playing hockey. Um, I, I was a, a goalie. I, I, I very much, I didn't start out playing hockey as a goalie. I started playing out as, you know, a defenseman and a forward. Uh, but then I, I gravitated, gravitated towards being goalie because, you know, I, I, I thought it was a unique position, you know, the buck stops here. Um, you know, I, I wasn't, you know, awesome. I knew I wasn't going to go to the NHL uh, or anything like that. Um, but I, I very much enjoyed it. Um, in the summer times, I, I raced mountain bikes uh, competitively. Uh, when I graduated high school, I think I was ranked like seventh or eighth in my age group for, you know, the beginner class for Norba. Um, you know, I, 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 I very much enjoyed that, you know, downhill ski racing, um, you know, things of that nature. So that's cool. It, probably not uncommon for a lot of people who self-select into Green Berets later on. I would imagine some some type of crazy upbringing. Um, where where does the Green Beret track come in for you? Well, you know, it another aspect of growing up. Um, you know, my dad was a college professor, and um, an opportunity presented itself uh, to him uh, for a sabbatical leave. And uh, it was to the sister university, which was located in Njoro, Kenya. Uh, Njoro is a, a small town um, in, in Kenya, um, kind of, I would say, central, like north, northwest central um, Kenya. Um, and it's adjacent to a larger city called Nakuru. And, you know, essentially, I want to say maybe two and a half, three hours away from Nairobi. And um, so, you know, he he took the the position over there. It was for a year. And uh, for my seventh grade uh, year uh, of middle school, uh, we we moved to Kenya, Africa and uh, lived there for a year. Um, I went to a British boarding school um, that was located in Nakuru. So, you know, a little ways away from Njoro, where where my dad was teaching and uh you know, I, I, I found that to be a really unique experience, you know, to be, you know, truly um, embedded, you know, so to speak, uh, you know, with with Kenyans, uh, Tanzanians, Ethiopians, Malawians, uh, Rwandans, Indians, um, you know, uh, other countries. Um, and, you know, through that experience, I I got to the point where, you know, I, I could have a conversation like this with somebody in Kiswahili and I could understand everything that they were saying, but I could only speak back, you know, in, in broken, broken Kiswahili. Um, and, you know, I, because it was a British, um, you know, format school, mm -hmm. um, I, I also um, was required to take uh, French uh, and German. And uh, so, you know, I, I think that later on, you know, pivoting. Now I'm in the military and, and whatnot. I, I I was exposed, obviously, to Fifth Special Forces Group and some some entities there 
uh, just because simply, you're at Campbell, right? Right, because yeah. I was at Campbell and in the proximity uh, of you know where Roxon land was in relation to where Fifth Group, their their area was. Um, I went to Ranger School uh, in 1998 uh, with with a couple of uh, Fifth Group guys um, and you know, some other infantry guys that, you know, were kind of talking about special forces and, and whatnot. And, you know, the, the more I looked into it, I was like, well, you know, shoot, I mean, that, that sounds pretty darn cool. You know, I mean, go, you know, to some foreign country, um, may or may not be, uh, you know, uh, permissible, you know, maybe a, a semi-permissible uh, or a denied area. And, you know, you, you link up with the locals and, um, you know, you, you break bread together, you, you eat, sleep, you, you sweat and bleed together and, uh, you, you learn the language, the local, you know, tri uh, uh, traditions and whatnot, and, you know, create partnerships. And I thought, I thought that was kind of cool. So that is, you know, I, I took the jump. I also, uh, grew up in Southern Africa in Zimbabwe. So I went oh, to a okay. British school as well, where they could hit you. Um, there was boarding school there i didn't Local go punishment. to the boarding school yeah full on and they played rugby did they do that in, uh, yes yeah, yeah. I, I played i played rugby um field hockey yep. you know track and field um you know got into got into all of it everything yeah um i thought this would be a place where we could jump to the time you did in kosovo uh, um so this is pre sf at that time Yes, yeah, pre SF. Right. Um, this was um, early early two thousand. Uh, we were there uh, about nine months uh, out of that year, and uh, so you know it was at the at the tail end of the uh, quote unquote air campaign and the beginning of, of the ground campaign. And um, you know while I while I was there, um, I was a, a scout squad leader. Um, interestingly enough, uh, there were, there was a, uh, special forces ODA from fifth group that was located on camp bond steel where, where, you know, we, we frequently went to and, uh, because there was a, a UAE contingent there. And so they were like the, you know, special forces liaison element for that UAE element. And there were a couple of times that I got to engage with them. Um, I went to one of their, uh, one of their team houses at one point where we were staging for an operation. So I had some exposure there, but, you know, Kosovo, um, you know, I, looking back, I would say that, uh, my experience there was, was, you know, on par with, with some of my experiences and the, the satisfaction that I got later on in my career as a Green Beret. Uh, you know, I was, I was a scout squad leader. Uh, and at that time, um, you know, I don't know if it was just, you know, the command climate, um, you know, we had, you know, most, if not, I, I would say probably 90% of, of the squad leaders, uh, the, the company commanders, um, you know, most of the team leaders and, you know, the company leadership were all Ranger qualified or had been in Ranger battalion. So there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of um, respect and responsibility that was placed on the shoulders of, of the NCOs, uh, whether you were, uh, you know, uh, uh, E5, E6, you know, whatever, it didn't matter. Um, so, you know, that was a really interesting period because for the first, I would say, um, five months of that deployment, we were on a, a pretty much a continuous op cycle. We would, we would receive our mission uh, directly from the battalion commander and the battalion sergeant major um, nice. the, the two, um, you know, our, our, um, our platoon sergeant and, and platoon leader, uh, had, you know, squad leader, you know, for first squad, second squad, third squad, we were in there on the brief, uh, we received our warning order from, from the BC and, and our, our CSM. And then, uh, we, we took that, we went back, the platoon sergeant and PL essentially assigned each one of us. Um, a, a portion, you know, you've got this area recon air, you know, zone, you've got this zone recon area, you know, like that. And then as, as squad leaders, we planned out according to the SH 21 75 Ranger handbook, you know, we, we planned out, 
uh, to extreme detail our operation, that how we were going to conduct it from start to finish. Um, we then would brief back our, our PL and platoon sergeant, as well as our BC and CSM, and we would get the thumbs up Jeez. or thumbs down. And then, you know, if it was thumbs up, um, we coordinated for aircraft to do an aerial overflight, identify and confirm our uh, landing zones and our pickup zones, uh, as well as to, you know, um, you know, confirm or deny uh, anything that, uh, you know, maybe was brought out during the planning process. Um, and then we would, we would get infilled, uh, you know, at ODARC 30, me as a squad leader with my four other uh, members, uh, you know, my RTO and, and my, my other guys, we would get infilled, you know, somewhere way out in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night. Uh, and we would be out there for, you know, five to seven days, snooping and pooping, you know, taking, you know, copious do it, like a recon, basically yeah, a recon yeah. mission. Yeah, we were doing reconnaissance uh, along the, the uh, Serbian and Macedonian border. Uh, because at the time, the um, the MTA or the, the military tactical agreement uh, that was previously in place was getting set to expire. And there was a worry that, uh, you know, there was going to be a flood of, um, you know, material support coming on, you know, the backs of donkeys uh, on the, you know, trails and whatnot uh, between, you know, Serbia, Macedonia uh, into Kosovo to, uh, you know, support, you know, whether it be the the, the Serbs uh, or the, the the Albanians, and that yeah. was the only real show in town at the time. I mean, late nineties, they're just we weren't engaged the way we would become just a couple of years after that. So right. it's probably pretty special to be over there doing that at the time. And yeah. that's pretty cool the way you're like engaging with the battalion commander, like planning your own mission, briefing it back. That yeah, sounds rare. That's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, I mean, looking back, looking back on it, you know, talking to, you know, some friends, you know, that, that spent time in the infantry during those, that, that period of time, um, you know, I, I guess it was a somewhat unique experience, but, you know, um, I, I, I feel like, you know, they, they had enough, you know, faith, trust and confidence in, yeah. in me and, you know, our, our platoon leadership to, to, um, to expect that we wouldn't drop the ball. And uh, one mission uh, that, that comes to mind, uh, my, my command sergeant major, um, a lot of people that, you know, may be listening uh, that, that spend time in the service uh, may recognize the name. His name is Jerry Taylor, uh, phenomenal guy, legend in, in the 75th Ranger Regiment. Uh, he actually uh, haloed in with uh, Delta Force uh, into Grenada. Uh, when he was a member of RRD, Ranger Regimental Reconnaissance Detachment. Um, but anyways, uh, Jerry uh, came up to me after my, uh, my, my operations brief, and he was like, hey there, Wild Dick, I'm going to come on this mission with you. And uh, he, he proceeded to, you know, be on the mission, and he made it very clear to me that he was not the Sergeant Major, not the Battalion Sergeant Major, he was Joe Snuffy, wow, member of the patrol, and um, you know I'll never forget it. Um, we, uh, you know, when we would set up our uh, hide sites, you know, our, our RON sites, you know, at night, uh, we would we would put two claymores out, you know, on the you know most likely avenues of approach. And um, I remember the the very first night that that, that we infilled. Um, it was a, a grueling movement um, over over some pretty mountainous terrain. Um, we had to move really slowly uh, and carefully because uh, of the time of year. You know, early uh, I think it was early spring. The the, um, the trees still hadn't uh, started to you know bud and leaf out, and there were still a lot of you know old leaves on the ground. So we wanted to make sure we were really quiet. We got into our hide site. And uh, Jerry, Jerry came up to me. He's like, hey, Bubba, I got to put out the Claymore. And I was like, all right, you know, <laughs> knock, knock yourself out. And so, you know, Sergeant Major Jerry Taylor goes low crawling out, 
you know, he's got the, got the wire, you know, the spool and everything and he set it up and he came back and he was like, you want, you can go check. That's the EIB standards. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just thought it was a, a that's so you know, cool. It, it was, it was a really unique experience yeah. to, you know, be able to have that. And, you know, that, that's your battalion Sergeant major who's got, you know, actual combat experience, you know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of cool stuff. And, you know, he's, He's just one of the guys. That is rare. That's got to be rare to have that happen. But that was nerve wracking. That that I got to imagine. Jeez. We almost we almost uh, crashed actually uh, on that infill. Um, you know, like I stated before, you know, we we did our aerial overflight and everything, and um, I'll never forget the name of the pilot. His name he was CW five Mopham, um, and uh, I remember we were on the bird. Uh, I was in the second bird. So, you know, we were, we were kind of flying like this and, um, for whatever reason, Mr. Mopham, CW5 Mopham decided to turn on his, uh, his, his, you know, massive floodlight. And as soon as he did that, I, I was on dog bone and, you know, uh, on comms, all I heard was, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. And the whole aircraft frame just started shaking. And, you know, he pulled cyclic, did what, I mean, you know better than I do, you know, helicopter function. But uh, he cranked that bird and every rivet must have come loose because we went straight up and then down. Jeez. And, you know, didn't get into it, you know, for the, for the rest of the flight to infill. Um, but when we came back uh, after Xville, we would do a um you know post mission air mission brief uh you know with uh with the air crew uh with the s2 and whatnot and uh mr mopham stood up and he was like hey who was on bird two for infill and i was like you know i was on that bird you know my my squad uh raised their hands and um he he basically said um i don't know if you guys knew what happened but um that's the closest I've ever come to death uh, on, on a on a on a flight. Evidently, what had happened was his spidey senses went up. He turned that light on, and he saw a wire, essentially a cable, like a, a thick cable that had been strung from one ridge line to the oh. next, and it was right in our flight path. And there's no way that those wire cutters would have would have done anything. Oh. So, oh, you know, that was uh, that was an experience. You never want a CW five saying that's the closest they got to death because they've right. flown forever. <laughs> well, he also spent time at one uh, sixtieth, so, yeah, so he, he was he ready. Seen some stuff. God, and so when I know it was a peacekeeping operation, but you guys got yeah. in a skirmish on the border. Well, I wouldn't really call it a skirmish. Um, so we were uh, we we got infilled. Um, on this particular mission uh, by vehicle. Um, interestingly enough, um, we the the village uh, that we had to go through and um, actually where we were dropped off was right behind the monastery, well, not monastery, but the Catholic church that um, Mother Teresa grew up in and actually found her calling. Um, yeah, very interesting. Actually, got to go into the uh, go into the church and uh, take a look at it. Uh, you know, at, at another point. But um, anyways, we uh, we got you know infilled by vehicle. We started you know making our way uh, up this ridge line uh, into our our area that we were responsible for conducting reconnaissance. And um, during our infill, um, there was some gunfire. There were, you know, a couple of volleys of gunfire that were in our direction. You know, we could hear them in the trees, you know, zipping past, um, breaking branches, you know, leaves. And, um, you know, we weren't exactly sure if that was an element, you know, of unknown, you know, size, you know, composition, whatever. Um, we didn't exactly know, you know, what, what their issue was, if they saw us, if they heard us, you know, whatever. Um, but it was definitely the first time that, you know, I think any of us had had, you know, gunfire in our direction. Um, you know, we, we hunkered down, 
Um, you know, we, we pulled security, made sure that, you know, nothing was coming. Um, and, you know, I called it up over the radio and, um, you know, we, we continued along our route and, um, we, we also were able to keep, you know, tabs on, on that element. We, we got eyes on them later and, uh, it turned out to be a, uh, a, a smuggling element, uh, you know, with weapons and ammunition, on uh you know donkeys and um what we did was uh we actually set up a an you know kind of a an interdiction an ambush of sorts um as they were coming up the trail and um we we interdicted them uh without incident no gunfire uh you know stani nadal uh you know halt stop in uh, uh albanian and uh in serbian and uh, they they stopped, and uh, you know we we took them into custody, and uh, I called up uh, one of our uh, other elements, our, our mortar platoon, and um, I I coordinated for a, a pickup of those individuals and and the material. So Jeez. that's a, I mean know. that's a pretty eventful Kosovo trip, I gotta say, um, yeah. especially just pre nine eleven. What yeah. a unique experience that that had to have been so useful for you to to build on and probably helped out a lot when you were going through, I would imagine Q course. Absolutely. Absolutely. It paid dividends, you know, um, you know, thinking about it a little bit more, you know, in the context, you know, I, I I do think that, you know, I, I grew up in a unique, um, you know, ecosystem and, um, you know, when, when I was in the Q course, especially, you know, uh, phase two, small unit tactics. Um, I have no idea what phase it is right now. I mean, they've done so many changes, but, you know, the small unit tactics phase, um, I I was essentially put into positions where, you know, um, the cadre at the time consisted largely of National Guard, uh, National Guard SF guys, mainly because, you know, um, when I was in the Q course, I mean, you know, we we had Afghanistan going on and uh iraq had had just kicked off and so you know i was looked at as you know i was ranger qualified i had you know multiple deployments already under my belt um i i conducted small unit you had actually like led small unit ops And, and so you know i i was you know looked at uh by by my my head cadre you know Hey, you know, go take the guys out in the woods and, uh, you know, teach them how to do an ambush. Go teach them this. <laughs> okay. All right. Go out in the woods and teach them how to do, uh, you know, a, a recon. Yeah. Um, and, you know, then later on, you know, when, when I finally got to an ODA, um, you know, I, 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 I became aware that, you know, not a lot of people had, had, had done that. Um, and, and, you know, not a lot of people had, um, you know, written operations orders, yeah. uh, you know, from, from command, you know, command guidance, you know, the warning order you, you received from one, you know, with one and two levels up intent. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it definitely, um, it definitely served me, uh, great value, you know, throughout yeah. the rest of my career. And just hearing you talk about warning orders and back briefs, like, at the time, you know, you look, you come to hate them, but man, yeah. when you're in the private sector, I miss them sometimes. Like the clarity that it yeah. requires and and planning that actually goes okay. into it. Man, I miss that. Anyway, that's yeah. a separate topic that we could get into at some point. Um, the alive day you described in 2005, it yes. occurs to me that that sounds very close to probably when you get out of your training. Like, is that your first deployment is when that goes down? Yeah, that was my first uh, my first deployment with, uh, with special forces. Um, you know, I I finished up. Um, I finished the Q course. Uh, the last phase for me was um, SEER school. You know, SEER C high risk. <clears throat> um, and so, you know, I finished that. Um, you know, I'm not going to get into a lot of the details, but it's a very significant emotional experience. Yeah. And, um, I, I, you know, graduated, uh, Sierra school, uh, I think it was like on a Thursday or Friday and, uh, I, you know, uh, 
I, I, I don't think I needed to, but I knew that 18 deltas had to, uh, you know, every two years you, you were required to go to, you know, back to the schoolhouse uh, for what's called or was called SOCMIS or SOFMIS. Uh, it's the basically the special operations combat medical uh, sustainment course. And, you know, it's, it's where you go for two weeks, you know, you, you get ACLS certified again, you get BLS certified, PALS certified, you know, so the pediatric advanced life support, advanced cardiac life support, basic life support. Um, and then, you know, you, there, there's other aspects, you know, tactical field care, um, you know, um, T tri C, you know, tactical combat casualty care, things like that. Anyways, um, I knew I, I, I was, you know, because of the length of the 18 Delta course and everything, I, I knew that, Hey, I, I want to show up to my unit as, as free and clear of, you know, later commitments as possible be, be, because I, I want to, I, I want to be there. I, 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 I went through all this training to get to a team and I, I don't want there to be any impediments. So, um, you know, I immediately finished SEER school and could have left and, and gone to come to, you know, uh, Colorado Springs to Fort Carson. But I, um, I took it upon myself to immediately do two weeks of uh, softness, uh, which may or may not have been a good idea with my mental, uh, you know, frame of mind at the time. But um, I finished that up. Um, I want to say it was like mid to uh, late August. And I, I took 30 days of leave. Uh, you know, in, in, in the process of, you know, traveling across the U S with my wife and mm -hmm. our nine month old infant son, uh, you know, and then, you know, to, took a little, little bit of time once we got here to, you know, move into the house that we bought and, you know, kind of get things set up and whatever. Um, but from the time that I actually signed in to second battalion, 10 special forces group and the time that we deployed for OIF-3 in 2004 was just under a month. Um, I, I remember, you know, I, I was an E-7 at the time. Um, you know, I, I actually made the E-7 list as an 11 Bravo wow. while I was in the Special Forces Medical Sergeant course. Um, and, you know, six years, 11 months uh, is, is when I made the list. You know, it's pretty quick. It's quick. Um, and, um, you know, so I showed up to my team, you know, multiple deployments already, you know, the, the, the experience of actually, you know, leading troops, uh, you know, doing op orders, engaging at the battalion level and whatnot. Um, and I showed up to my team and I just remember basically, uh, being told, Hey, you're the senior medic, um, there's a bunch of medical crap that battalion dropped off. You need to go through that. You need to take care of it. And if you have any questions, I'll give you a call. And, and I was like, <laughs> Oh, all right, cool. Um, you know, so, so that was, that was essentially, you know, like my, my welcome, my welcome <laughs> to the Google, you know, um, how, how, um, God, man, I can't imagine like going down range after 30 days, like not knowing the team. How long do well, you felt like it took to get for them to trust you maybe? And, and I'm I'm sure coming in as an E7 who had had some deployments like that has to help, but they must have gelled quite a bit by that time. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I would say that, you know, with, with, well, within the first month, uh, you know, of, of having deployed, you know, downrange. So, you know, my cumulative total, you know, SF experience at that point was like, you know, what, two months. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I, I never, I never felt as though I was looked at necessarily as a new guy or, yeah. you know, a, you know, you, you know, shut up, sit in the corner and color, you know, for a bit and, and watch how this is done. Uh, I was, I was, you know, very much brought into, you know, course of action uh, development uh, for for operations, uh, you know, mission analysis. Um, I I got into, um, you know, being one of the primary routes uh, planners uh, for our operations. 
you know, doing the analysis, you know, IED strike analysis, uh, you know, the various ticks uh, that have occurred, you know, so that we could plan our routes and, you know, at least, you know, ensure to some degree of, of certainty that, you know, we weren't going to be putting ourselves at risk. Um, I also did uh, a lot of uh, close target reconnaissance uh, that, that we would do in, um, you know, uh, IOVs. Uh, IOV stands for uh, indigenous operating vehicle. Uh, you know, basically, you know, the, the normal cars that you see on the road, um, you know, we, we had a small fleet of those, uh, you know, that were kitted out with, uh, you know, comms equipment. Uh, we tried to, you know, improvise some armor by uh, putting some, um, you know, like um, carbon fiber, you know, aramid fiber, uh, you know, plates or whatever that we would cut with saws and whatever and put on the inside of the doors. But, uh, you know, did, did a lot of that. Um, right now, off let me ask you something, Ryan, just real quick. How I'm curious, cause you had done Kosovo. So I remember the first time I was in like a war zone on the ground, kind of outside a base, not with the military, but with the mm -hmm. agency. And it was unsettling at first for me, just rolling around without like what I was used to with, without all the protection that I was typically used to. I mean, doing low vis recon ops in yeah. an indigenous vehicle, um, what, was it unsettling or did it, did it take a little bit to get used to, or did you feel like you'd already kind of done this being out outside the wire in Kosovo? I, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, just say nonchalantly like, Oh yeah, you know, that's, that's old hat. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. um, because you know, every single situation is different. Um, but I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't really remember, um, you know, feeling, um, you know, a, a, a pending sense of doom or gloom, uh, or any of that, you know, being light infantry, uh, you know, or previous in my career and, you know, doing, uh, all the dismounted stuff that I did, you know, I, I personally hated vehicles. I, I was like, you know, vehicles are, you know, a magnet for gunfire. They're a magnet for, you know, mines or IEDs, like, they're, they're a target, you know, if, if it's me and, you know, my guys and we're out in the woods, you know, we, we have a much lower signature, you know, we can hide, we can, you know, dig hide sites, you know, things like that. So, you know, I mean, was there uh, maybe a enhanced level of comfortability, comfortability? Yeah, I think so. Um, but, you know, the, there were also situations where, um, where, yeah, I mean, the pucker factor was definitely up there. Um, one, one instance was we were doing a, um, a, a, a CTR um, in um, Aloe. What's, can you def what's a CTR? Uh, for uh, Sorry, close target reconnaissance. Um, so we were doing a close target reconnaissance um, in um, basically of, of an objective, a target location uh, that we were looking at, at hitting later on. And uh, it was in the village of uh, Al Oja. Al Oja is where Saddam Hussein was was actually captured, just south of Tikrit. And it was, you know, basically the stronghold of the Al Abadi uh, tribe. And um, it was very much a, um, you know, Bathist stronghold. Uh, and you know, it was like, it was almost like the twilight zone, you know, if they knew they, I mean, they knew if a vehicle did not belong there, you know, even if it was an Iraqi driving the vehicle. And, you know, I, I remember us, um, I was driving, uh, I remember us, you know, driving in and then driving around and, you know, the, you know, as the minutes went by, you know, we were noticing people, you know, looking at us, you know, more oddly than than the last person and um then you know it got to the point where we we were turning down some roads and and finding that there were there were barricades that were put up and um you know it it my my spidey senses were were definitely flaring up uh when that was going on because um a uh, a classmate of mine uh, Gary, I won't say his last name, but 
Uh, Gary uh, was a classmate of mine uh, all through the Q course. We graduated together. Um, he went to fifth group and um, he, um, he was killed uh, during uh, a CTR operation. Uh, I believe it was in Baghdad, uh, him and, and an interpreter. There was a lot of, lot of things that didn't go right uh, from, from the very beginning in the planning uh, phases of, of that operation. But, uh, you know, that was, that was in the back of my mind. Like, you know, this is not good. We should not be here. We need to leave. That's, uh, I think that's the impression I would get when you're going out there, low viz. Um, it just has to be like that spidey sense. You probably have to be so attuned to what's yeah. going on all around you, knowing that they know this neighborhood better than anyone. You yeah. Know, and anything's going to stick out. I remember one time we infilled, we had a Pathfinder um, detachment. I can't remember, yeah. you know, like a small contingent with us at coast in Afghanistan. And, and they just wanted to get outside the wire. They were really kind of like a, almost like a pararescue type. If we had to drop somebody in to help out a downed aircraft, they would go in, but they, you know, they're infantry guys. They want to get out. They're 101st guys. They want to get outside the wire. And we put them in, we didn't fill them. And they would just get detected so quickly because the the enemy just knows that area. So being yeah. in a, like trying to really hide out when you're going after a target or trying to get in close, God, that sounds crazy. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's difficult, you know, I mean, you know, the vehicle aspect is one thing, you know, helicopter insertion uh, or, you know, other insertion methods, um, you know, even with offsets, you know, mm -hmm. of, of, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20K, um, you know, the, the, the risk of detection is always there because you're not in your backyard. No. You know, no. Um I mean, I, I remember uh, you, you just reminded me of uh, one of the uh, one of the reconnaissance patrols that that we were on in Kosovo. You know, every effort was made to conceal our hide site, um, you know, cover our tracks, everything. And, you know, what happened? A, a, a freaking goat herder, you know, just following his goats, stumbled upon our hide site, you know. I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, how, how do you, how do you plan for that? I mean, you know, you, you can't. God. The, um, the, and so it sounds like you got there late 04, right? This attack, it, did I get yes. that right? And the attack, the, um, April kind of SVBID hits. Yep. Were you, we were, we were set to redeploy, uh, in June. So, oh, geez. It was, uh, it was, it was kind of, you know, towards the tail end of, of the deployment and, um, you know, yeah. What, what was the, the mission set like leading up to that attack? Cause I have to imagine like for them to target your building at that time, they were probably frustrated with the work you all were doing. Were, were you out like hitting targets, um, at night? Was it more recon related? What were you guys doing then? Well, I would say, you know, during that period and, you know, especially into crit, um, I mean, yeah, we were, we were doing hits. Um, but I would say, you know, the, the, the primary focus, uh, uh, that we had was, was training the, the Iraqi military. Um, we, we would go to the birthday palace, uh, there in Tikrit and the birthday palace, you know, for, for those that don't know, um, you know, there's that famous, famous photograph of, and video footage of Saddam Hussein, um, you know, standing on that balcony with the pistol. And oh yeah. The pistol. That was the birthday palace. And that was where they would do all the military parades and all that. And so, um, that was taken over by the Iraqi military. There was a, uh, conventional force element that was there as well. And what, what we were doing was we were training the Iraqi military in, you know, basic infantry tasks. And there was also a cadre element that we um, did advanced training with. And they also had, you know, a moniker of, of the Iraqi scout platoon. And they were, they were essentially our strike force. God. So, you know, during the days we were, we, you know, we're, we're teachers, coaches, mentors, you know, instructors. And, you know, then at night, you know, we'd 
put on our other hat or really helmet with night vision and, you know, go and execute targets with these folks. Um, it was, it was pretty interesting. Um, you know, we were, we were definitely making impacts and, um, the, the, the model that, that our ODA was, uh, basically developing and executing, uh, e essentially became, um, the, the, the model template for later, you know, years in, in Iraq, um, of the, the training and the teaching methodology for the Iraqi military. You know, um, it just strikes me. One of the things that I like to ask people about is if, especially with the amount of the op tempo that you saw and the amount of deployments, like when you think of those operations, is there one that comes to mind about, uh, kind of in terms of before the op, you're like this thing, this one could go sideways. This could be a tough one. Um, just based on whatever the target, the infill, um, the environment. Yeah, there, there, there's a couple that come to mind. Um, they were, they were in later, later deployments to Iraq. Um, I mean, like you said, um, you know, I, I, I do have a number of deployments, you know, I mean, there's guys with, with, you know, more, but, um, how many did you do, Ryan? Um, you know, all in all, uh, um, you know, if you include Kosovo, because, you know, Kosovo is kind of one of those weird ones, you know, with the time frame mm -hmm. and the uh, the State Department declaration, you know, of the status of, of that theater. Um, but if you include that, uh, nine combat deployments total between nice. Kosovo, Afghanistan and Iraq, um, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of like uh, 64, 67 months uh, total. And then... Um, you know, I, I also uh, had had time and focus um, in, um, in on the continent of Africa, um, you know, North Africa, Libya, shortly after the fall of Gaddafi uh, doing some stuff. But um, but yeah, um, one one of those uh, hairy moments was uh, we we were going after a jam commander. Uh, jam stands for Jay Shalmati. It was the militia that was you know, run by uh, Maktad al-Sadr. Uh, Sadr City was his enclave. I mean, he he was the man in Sadr City. And um, they were they were Shia militia. So they were directly aligned with, you know, Iran and, uh, you know, Qatab, Hezbollah, Hezbollah, you know, all the various offshoots. And um, that was also where, uh, you know, a lot of the coordination was taking place for the... Um, uh, you know, material transport and funneling uh, of the uh, explosively formed penetrators, the EFPs that, you know, essentially, um, you know, cut through any armor like Swiss cheese. Um, you know, a five inch uh, EFP plate will cut through an M1 Abrams tank armor. Uh, and, you know, that's just to, you know, express it's the uh, severity of, of, of those suckers. Um, but so we were we were going into uh, Sadr City um, to get a, uh, a Jaysh al Mahdi Jam Commander uh, who was responsible and involved in in the transport of of these this material, not just from Iran, but uh, you know throughout Iraq. And um, the the objective location was um, what we what we called the around the pitcher's mound. Uh, the reason why baseball terminology was utilized for the describing Sadr City is because of the axis that it sat along the, the main MSR or, you know, uh, material supply route, um, you know, the road. Uh, I think it was called Route Pluto. And uh, Route Pluto, if anybody knows about Iraq, uh, that was, that was you know, one of the most heavily uh, EFP roads. It was like the, the test road, uh, if you will, for EFPs. Um, but anyways, um, Sadr City was essentially a, a square that was at an angle and it looked like a baseball diamond. So, you know, we'd say home plate, first base, second base, third base, pitcher's mount. Interesting. I did not know that. Cool. Yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, uh, Sadr City was not not a, uh, a, a permissive environment at all. Uh, if you did not belong there, especially if you were any form of Iraqi government force, U.S. military force, um, you, you were going to stir up a hornet's nest. So, you know, we, we, uh, we, we knew that, um, 
you know, like I said, um, you know, previously I, I was very heavily involved in, in routes. Um, you know, I was, I was one of the primary drivers, um, for all of our patrols, um, and because of my experience and, and my abilities with, you know, route analysis and, and all of that, um, which definitely paid dividends on this mission because we went in, um, we, we made it to the objective with, with, without issue. Uh, we, we executed the target. Unfortunately, it was dry hole. Um, but on Xville, um, our partner force, uh, which was the, uh, we were partnered with the emergency response brigade ERB, uh, which is essentially, you know, compared to, um, uh, like the, uh, FBI HRT, you know, national level, uh, high yeah. risk, uh, you know, high risk, uh, mission force. Um, we got separated and, uh, we, we ended up popping out onto, uh, route Pluto and, you know, listening on the radio, uh, everybody was like, you know, Hey, whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. And we were like, you know, Hey, what, what, what's going on? And, um, you know, had one of, uh, one of our interpreters in the back of the vehicle and he had a ICOM radio and he was in contact with, with our partner force. And it was the, it just so happened to be, uh, during our op cycle, we were, we were out with the company um, that that I was directly, you know, responsible for and partnered with for training, you know, management and all of that. And so, you know, I, I heard Lath, uh, who was the company uh, company first sergeant, you know, talking to our interpreter, saying, "Hey, you know, we're separated. We don't know where we're at. We're, you know, we, we we're lost." And um, you know, long story short, you know, there was. There was some communication, uh, you know, with the the ISR platform uh, that we had overhead uh, to identify, you know, where where they were where they were stuck, where they were lost, and um, there was a lot of lot of communication, you know, between my team leader, team sergeant, the the uh, the team warrant, um, and you know, it was. I, I very much sensed that there was there was paralysis taking place. You know, what do we do? We're separated. Ah, we can't we we can't let them you know get chewed up, you know, in a meat grinder. But you know, do we go in and risk our lives? And you know, it 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 got to the point. You know, right, wrong. Um, you know, I, I looked over at my team later, um, who who was in you know in the the TC seat, the passenger seat, and I said fuck it. We're going to get them. And I, I made the call. I knew the routes. I, I knew where not to go. And I knew based on the communication exactly where Lath was with, with the, the ERB company. And so I knew that time was of the essence. And if, if we, we let that eclipse, we were going to lose our window of opportunity. So, um, knowing full well that shit could go sideways sideways at any second. Um, I made the call and I, I blasted into Sauter city and uh, I linked up with Lath, and, uh, and, and we, we, we expelled as quickly as we could um, without incident. And uh, we made it back, but uh, you know, that was, that was, um, that was a definite, uh, you know, scary moment. Um, Another incident, um, we were doing a mission, again, going after a uh, Jaysh al-Mahdi commander in uh, an area just adjacent uh, to the east and a little bit southeast of Sadr City um, called New Baghdad and um, another garden location uh, of Baghdad. And uh, we we knew that... Um, that the the early warning network was robust. We knew that the um, you know the the material support in terms of you know RPGs, AKs, PKMs, uh, EFPs that were possible were substantial. But we knew we had to go do the op. So we uh, the the ERB um, were. I believe we had 
three or four uh, of these large armored vehicles. They were called Rivas, uh, very kind of a, a Bush League MRAP, you know, that, that the U.S. military has or didn't actually have at the time. I think the Riva was like a South African, uh, you know, armored vehicle. Um, so we had three or four of those with our ERB uh, force. And then uh, we had uh, an open back um, Humvee, Gunvee, and two uh, of the 1151, you know, full armored uh, Humvees. We went in, uh, executed the mission. Uh, again, uh, you know, early warning, uh, whatever. Uh, it ended up being a dry hole. And uh, we began our expel route. To our left, we, there, there was a canal. To the right, there was uh, probably about a, a 100 to 150 meter, you know, open field of, of you know, dirt, uh, trash, old, you know, rusted out vehicles, dead animals, you know, livestock. I mean, it was, it was surreal. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, we're expelling, we're making our way along this road, um, you know, completely blacked out. Uh, we did a lot of driver's training with our uh, Iraqi ERB counterparts, uh, you know, to practice driving under night vision and everything so that, you know, we could, we could truly have the advantage. Um, but we were driving blacked out and, um, for whatever reason, uh, you know, uh, my vehicle, uh, that, that I was driving, uh, we, we were in the lead and, um, or I'm sorry, we were, we were in the second vehicle. The, the thought process was, you know, a, a Riva could sustain, um, a, a more uh, direct hit from an EFP if we hit one uh, due to the fact that it's it's an armored vehicle, much more armored than the um, the Humvees. Uh, and, you know, it, it was a little bit more elevated. So, you know, we, we put that vehicle in the lead, but the driver was having issues with his night vision. They were cutting out. He was having problems seeing whatever. So um, the decision was made, okay, Ryan, you know, leapfrog, take the lead and, and guide us. Okay, cool. We probably went maybe another 100, 150 meters down the road. Um, we were about probably 500 meters away from um, the, the main hardball, the highway, uh, you know, that would essentially, you know, take us out uh, and, and back to uh, the green zone. But um, we switched vehicles, the, the order of vehicle, and I don't know how it happened, but um, the second vehicle, that Reba, ended up triggering the EFP array that was set up for our patrol. And um, it, it had to have been at least, a, you know, three to five EFP array uh, that was set up. And uh, it, it took out um, three of the four tires uh, on the Reba. Uh, you know, rim, you know, completely shredded the rim and the tires. Um, it shredded the drive shaft. Um, it punctured the the engine, the transmission. But thankfully, the, the troop compartment, uh, you know, remained intact. Uh, nothing made it through. Um, and so a large uh, firefight uh, ensued after that. Uh, we, we were receiving, you know, some... Uh, machine gun fire and some rifle fire from, you know, across that open field. And, uh, you know, we, we essentially commenced to, you know, opening up a large can of whoop ass, uh, with, you know, 40 Mike, Mike, um, 50 Cal 762, you know, everything we, we could bring to bear, uh, on them, um, quickly got that to settle down. And then it became, you know, essentially a, a very protracted uh, vehicle recovery operation Jeez. in a very bad area. Um, needless to say, uh, you know, the, the Rivas were going down, trying to haul, you know, the, the heavy downed Riva. Um, and uh, we were, we were making our way back uh, to the green zone, but very, very slowly, you know, we, we'd have to uncouple one Riva and hook up another one to allow that transmission and engine to cool down so that we could drag it a little bit more. And, uh, you know, the cool thing was, is, 
um, as a, a show of force to, you know, kind of provide us with, um, you know, coverage and protection. We ended up having uh, two F-16s that were essentially doing cycles, cycle runs over top of us. You know, they were basically going like this nice, and they yeah. were dropping down to shit. I would say, you know, probably about a hundred feet, um, you know, above the deck screaming past, you How know, surreal is that, that you're just oh, in this war. I mean, amazing. Those things are screaming past, you know, how loud they are. And you're towing a, a heap of junk that's just yeah. been decimated by some of the biggest explosives on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was surreal to say the least, you know, having, having these fly by, I mean, you know, uh, needless to say, you know, the, the, the word was out, you know, don't mess with those guys because uh, you're, you're going to, you're going to get it. It, it. Am I right to think like if you hadn't switched places, that would have hit your vehicle. Yeah. And yeah. a smaller, less defended. Oh yeah. Humvee. I mean, it you probably know, would have destroyed you. It, it, I mean, I, I'm, I'm firmly convinced with, you know, every, I mean, the, the eyewitness, um, you know, experiences that I've, that I've had with, with EFPs and other, um, you know, roadside bombs, everybody would have been killed in the vehicle. All of us. Yeah. It's just because the Riva was elevated a bit and a little yep. more defended. Yep. Jeez. Yeah. Um, and what, one of the things that occurs to me that I, I do try to ask when we've got a, like a medic on like yourself, you know, there's, there's probably the highs and lows that you experience a little bit closer than anybody where you save people kind of like you described with your live day. But I assume there are times where you lose somebody too. Yeah. Um, whether it's at your hands or a handoff, could you talk through just one of those moments? Like how connected you get to that patient or I don't even know if you call them a patient at the time. Well, I mean, yeah, they're a patient, but you know, they're, they're your brother or your sister. Yeah. You know, you know them. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and that, that even goes for, um, you know, our Iraqi counterparts. I mean, I've been in plenty of gunfights with, with, you know, standing shoulder to shoulder with them too. A um, couple, couple of uh, instances come to mind. Uh, one uh, was a, an op we did. Um, I, this kind of, you know, kind of ties in our, our previous conversation. Um, there was a mission that we had in uh, Hey Amal. Uh, hey, Alma was a, uh, a Sunni neighborhood um, right outside of the Flying Man Gate, the famous Flying Man Gate of uh, Baghdad International Airport. Um, it, it basically went right on to Route Irish, which, again, was one of the worst, most IED roads, um, and then, you know, connected over to the Green Zone. Hey, Alma was literally like right outside that Flying Man Gate, right outside of the Baghdad International Airport. Um, I mean, firefights would, would happen there almost all the time when ICTF, Iraqi counterterrorism force would go in there, ISOF, Iraqi special operations forces, uh, us with the ERB. I mean, you know, you, you'd go in blacked out, um, and under night vision, you know, you could just see piles of brass shimmering to where, where previous firefights had occurred. Um, but on this instance, um, you know, we were we were doing a a large scale uh, company ERB operation, and um, there were four targets, four individual targets, and we were going to hit them all simultaneously. Um, we we exited the flying man gate, made a turn at the edge, you know, proximity of the uh, Hey Amo neighborhood. We stopped our vehicles and conducted what's called a, a VDO vehicle drop off. And then we, we conducted four independent foot movements. Um, there was two Green Berets with each uh, partner, larger partner force element of ERB. And we, we made our way on foot through the neighborhood uh, to our individual targets. And once we got to the target, uh, you know, obviously, you know, there's, there's walls and there's, there's gates, you know, around everybody's house. Uh, so we, uh, we use the ladders, uh, to, you know, get over the, the walls, um, you know, opened up the, the courtyard gate, the force went in, 
Um, and then we, we placed our charges uh, on the, the designated uh, breach points and made the call and you know said, hey, I'm set, objective one set, objective two set, three, four, okay? Uh, I have control, I have control, I have control. Three, two, one, boom, you know. Um, however, uh, on, on my objective, right before we were uh, getting ready to uh, uh, actually, you know, set off our, our breach charge, make entry and uh, wreck havoc, um, a PKM opened up. Uh, PKM is a, uh, a Russian, you know, 762 uh, machine gun. It, it opened up uh, on, on my objective, right, right, you know, essentially on the courtyard and the gate uh, entrance to the courtyard. And I was, I was actually standing uh, at the uh, edge uh, corner, if you will, of the, uh, the wall where the gate, you know, opens up. And I had a couple of Iraqis uh, that were, were next to me. Uh, there was about five or six of them, you know, pulling security outside, you know, pulling security, you know, upwards on the, on the structure as the main force was prepping to do the uh, breach. PKM opened up, um, sparks were flying all around off the metal gate, off the ground, you know, um, the pavement, you know, and, you know, dancing all around me. Um, and immediately we, uh, three of those, you know, five to six guys that were like literally shoulder to shoulder or in arms width away, uh, went down with, uh, with various gunshots. Um, we, we affected breach. Um, the other three targets were, were being taken down. And, uh, I, uh, I turned to Kurt who was, you know, our, uh, our, our senior 18 echo on the team. And I said, Hey bro, you're in charge of the objective. Now I, I gotta, I gotta tend to these casualties. So, um, two of the, or I'm sorry, one of them was ambulatory, meaning he could, you know, walk under his own power. Um, and two of them were, you know, I, I would say litter patients, uh, you know, they, they were, they were not able to move under their own power, uh, due to the, the nature of their injuries. And so, you know, we, you know, pulled them in, um, and I, I, you know, told some other guys that were out there, Hey, you know, start shooting, lay down fire, um, went into the house and, um, I, uh, I assessed all the casualties. The, the most uh, gravely injured uh, Iraqi had taken uh, uh, multiple rounds uh, through, through both, both uh, glutes, you know, both ass cheeks. Um, he had uh, an exit wound um, in his abdomen and he also had an exit wound um, in his, in his uh, perineum, his taint, for lack of a better term. And, uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, um, I had to, I had to go into medic mode. I had to begin treating, um, wouldn't you know it, uh, every set of, um, uh, latex gloves that I had, um, had, uh, had either dry rotted. So when I tried to put them on, they just shredded. Um, so, you know, I, I ended up having to treat this guy in his nether regions with no gloves um, and, and get them packaged up. Um, you know, objective went down, Kurt, Kurt did amazing. Uh, the rest of our force did amazing. The other objectives, you know, went down and, uh, everybody consolidated, uh, onto our objective to facilitate the, um, the loading of these casualties and, uh, in Xville. And, you know, we brought them to the, uh, cash in the green zone and, um, they, they ended up all, all three of them pulling through doing well and, uh, you know, joining the, uh, the, the unit again, once they recovered, um, another, another instance, um, probably the, the, the one that, uh, you know, haunts me the most, um, it, it really wasn't, I mean, it wasn't an operation or, or anything like that. Um, I was, uh, this was during, we were in Bakuba, uh, Iraq. This was, uh, I think OIF-4. 
2007 time frame, or no, I'm sorry, 2006 time frame, and uh, I was I was the the vehicle guy. You know, I I did um, you know the the maintenance on our Humvees. I did the maintenance on our NSTVs, our non stacked non standard tactical vehicles, our Hilux pickups. Um, I did the maintenance on our, our Iraqi force, uh, partner force vehicles, um, you know, Humvees, uh, all of our IOVs, indigenous operating vehicles. And so, you know, this morning um, I was was like any other day. Uh, I went to uh, the, the chow hall on on FOB Gabe, which at the time had, you know, substantially uh, drawn down. It was part of the Iraqi BRAC or base uh, realignment and closure <laughs> plan uh, to consolidate, and so you know most of the uh, most of the conventional forces had had left. There was only like a skeleton crew that were uh, doing. You know, uh, I think they were they were called the uh, MIT and PIT teams. Uh, basically, they were focused on uh, training the Iraqi uh, military police, or I'm sorry, police force as well as military um, from a conventional standpoint. Um, so anyways, you know, went to, went to breakfast, uh, on, on the, on the main base. Uh, I had breakfast with the assistant, uh, Fob Mayer, uh, whose, whose name was Corporal Brock Buckland. Um, I talked to him frequently, you know, we would, we would coordinate, uh, you know, for, for various activities that we had going on, uh, expansion that we were doing, uh, with our training area that we had. Uh, for our partner force, Iraqi element and whatnot. And, you know, I mean, Brock was a, he was a great kid, you know, great kid. Well, you know, after breakfast, I went back to our, our, uh, our compound, our, I mean, we essentially had a, a large base to ourselves. Um, and I was working on one of our vehicles. Um, my, my iPod died. Uh, so I went into our, our, our team house and I was going to plug it in, you know, to get some get some tunes. Well, as I was passing through our uh, our ready room area where all of our gear was in our radio room, I I heard on the radio a a a very a, a radio call. If you've you know heard calls before, you can you can discern the the level of of severity, um, you know, based on the tenor uh, of the voice uh, on the radio. And I instantly knew that there was a dire situation that was unfolding uh, on, on the, the conventional side of the base. And I knew from the call sign, um, you know, where it was. So, you know, essentially it, without saying anything um, to anybody on my team, um, I think the only thing that I did say was to one of the guys on the team that was, you know, on radio, radio talk watch at the time, I said, Hey, I'm, I'm grabbing a freaking a bag and I'm going. And that's all I said. I grabbed my a bag. I grabbed my rifle. Uh, I don't even think I grabbed my rifle. I grabbed my a bag and I jumped in a, a, a Hilux pickup and I, I hauled ass as fast as I could to, to where I knew uh, this this incident was unfolding. When when I arrived on scene, it was I, I would say less than ten minutes after the the initial injury. And what had happened was is in the course of the base realignment and closure, FOB Gabe was you know contracting. They were they were moving. Uh, Jersey barriers, Alaska barriers, you know, those really heavy reinforced concrete barricades that were put up, you know, for blast mitigation and, you know, protect from gunfire and whatnot. Well, they were, they were moving a lot of these uh, to reposition the perimeter as well as, you know, free up uh, inventory so they could bring them to uh, FOB Warhorse, which was, you know, across town uh, where, everything was essentially moving. Well, Brock being the assistant FOB mayor was supervising the uh, KBR um, employees who were loading with cranes 
these Jersey barriers and Alaska barriers onto the backs of uh, flatbed pickup trucks uh, or uh, semis. Well, Brock happened to be at uh, the wrong place at the right time um, when one of the chain links that they were using to lift up one of these, you know, 30,000 pound barriers, uh, it snapped and a section of one, that chain link became a missile and it hit Brock in the, in the trachea. It crushed about two to three cartilaginous rings. It glanced off. It severed his external uh, jugular and his carotid artery approximately 80%. And then came to rest on the back, on the inside, the backside of his chest cavity. And when I got uh, to, to the site, um, I did a quick assessment and, you know, opened up my aid bag. Um, you know, there was a, a Lieutenant Colonel. He was, uh, he was in charge of the, uh, the MIT and the pit teams. He was a former SF dude, but, you know, he was there and he was, you know, shaken because, you know, he was technically the mayor and this was his, you know, assistant mayor and, you know, somebody that he had spent a lot of time with. And so, you know, I, I knew, you know, I, I had to get the situation under, under control. So I immediately, you know, uh, pulled out a, a, um, uh, something that, that notes could be written on with a, a Sharpie. And I gave that to him and I said, you're my recorder, start recording. And I wanted to give him a job. I wanted to occupy him, you know, instead uh, of just sitting there and worrying and, right. and spinning out of control, you kind of, right. I guess you're taught to give somebody something to do. Well, I mean, I don't learn. necessarily know if you're, you're taught that per se. I mean, you know, um, you know, BSI, CNA safe, number of patients, um, you know, do I need assistance? You know, Hey, you know, boom, you, you get into, yeah. you know, yeah. it's, Kind of comprised in the 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 initial uh assessment but you know i i just i just knew i i needed to occupy him i needed to you know give give him a task so he could focus on something and not be in the way um so you know i i opened up my aid bag uh one of the kbr uh you know crane operators or truck drivers or whatever had taken his shirt off and he had he was holding it over brock's neck to apply pressure and I, and so I knew, okay, you know, this is what they're telling me happened. Obviously I can see there's, you know, pressure being put on the neck. Um, you know, I, I don't know what I'm going to be, um, uh, you know, dealing with, but I, I opened up my aid bag. I got my curl X ready. Um, I had my minor surge kit, uh, you know, opened up. I had multiple, uh, forceps, uh, on standby. Cause I didn't know if I was going to have to, you know, uh, clamp, clamp vessels, uh, you know, one, once I, I got in there. So I, um, I told the, uh, um, PBR guy, okay, you know, remove the, uh, remove your shirt. I visualized what was going on. Uh, very small, very small, uh, you know, uh, entrance wound, you know, no exit. Um, Brock was, you know, able to, able to talk, you know, somewhat, uh, real raspy given the, the trauma that he had sustained. And he was, he was going out in and out of consciousness. Uh, you know, he was not alert and oriented times three, you know, to person, place, uh, in, in time. Um, and I, I, I knew that was a problem. I knew he was, he was hemodynamically unstable. And I also knew that, um, you know, based on the pressures that I got, um, that uh, I needed to get his pressures up to a safe level so that his organs could still perfuse. Because, you know, once you drop below a, a blood pressure of 60, 60 systolic, um, you know, you, you run the risk of organs um, not being perfused and, and dying. Um, so what I did was... Um, in order to uh, address the wound, um, I had to improvise. Uh, 
Uh, I knew that, you know, with all the, uh, you know, nerves and other vasculature and everything, I didn't want to go in there with forceps and open it up to visualize anything. I knew that I needed to just provide pressure in order to, you know, stop the bleeding. Um, but, you know, the conundrum is how do you, how do you apply pressure on, on the neck and not, you know, impact uh, breathing, not impact blood flow, you know, cerebral blood flow, flow via the other, the other side, the other vasculature on the neck. So what I did was I, um, I grabbed a, uh, a, a C-splint, a C-spine splint that has, you know, an open window uh, around the, the vasculature, but is able to provide circumferential pressure at the same time. So what I did was I, I utilized uh, Curlex to you know plug the wound and then build up a mass that then I was able to put the C collar on in order to provide mm -hmm. additional pressure and stability for that dressing. I stopped the bleeding. Um, and at, at that point, I assessed that you know I, IVs, uh, IV fluids were necessary. Well, you know, the question then becomes, do I use a crystalloid or do I use a colloid? What that essentially means is, do I use a crystalloid solution like normal saline that um, essentially will increase, you know, your, your vast, your, your circulating volume, but um, more is required in order to sustain, yeah. sustain that. And you oftentimes run the risk of, of blowing clots out. And I didn't want to do that because I also didn't know exactly what the nature of the internal injuries were mm. on Brock. So the other option is a uh, colloid, which is a large molecule um, that um, also has the capacity of pulling in fluid to the vascular space from the extravascular space so that you get a little bit more bang for your buck. It also stays within systemic vascular circulation uh, much longer than a crystalloid solution. So, you know, I, I forget the exact details of the protocol, but you do a 500 cc push of your, of your colloid, you reassess vitals. If you've gotten a positive response, but it hasn't gone above, you know, a certain systolic, you're able to do another push of 500 cc's, but 1,000 cc's or one liter is the max of, of a colloid that you can push. So I, I pushed, uh, I ended up pushing um, a liter, um, you know, going through the protocol and um, I got Brock ANO times three. He knew where he was. He knew who I was. He knew, you know, sure. what was going on. And, you know, we were, we were having a conversation and he was like, Hey man, you know, like, am I going to be okay? You know, um, so on and so forth. And, you know, at this time, you know, I, I, I had gotten the, um, the, the, the aircraft, the medevac aircraft called from, uh, LSA Anaconda. Uh, they were in route and I was like, Hey Brock, buddy, I got you, bro. You know, I got you patched up. You're, you're talking to me now. We're talking, you're good. You know, you're going to make it to the hospital. We're going to treat you. And, you know, I'll, 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 I'll probably be able to call you later tonight. We, we, we picked up the litter uh, that we had put him on and we moved the, uh, the short distance to the HLZ, the helicopter landing zone. And the, uh, the medevac helicopter landed and we put Brock on. And, you know, I, I had responsibility. Brock was my patient. And I didn't feel comfortable putting him in on, on a bird uh, whether or not they were me they were flight medics or not, I knew that they were not at my level. And um, I tried everything I could to get on the bird. The lieutenant colonel even, you know, was was bitching at the pilots and, and the crew chief, you know, saying, hey, he's getting on the bird and he's going to manage the patient. And because I didn't have a rifle, because I didn't have body armor, because I was in civilian clothes, um, they, they would not let me on the bird. So, you know, Time was of the essence, so I said, "Okay, take off, fly as fast as you can, get him, get him to, to the, uh, to the, the hospital." Bird took off, 
I got on the radio and uh, I, I called the, uh, the, the hospital and um, I let them know exactly what was going on uh, with Brock. I, I, I let them know exactly what the injuries were that were visualized. I gave them the rundown of the uh, vitals uh, initially in progression through treatment. I gave them a rundown of exactly what treatments were, were administered. Um, and I told them specifically that you need to have whatever vascular surgeons that you have on hand you need to have them right there at the HLZ, ready to receive Brock when he gets off that aircraft and moves into surgery. Got that all set up and Brock landed alive, ANO times three, went into surgery. And when they removed my, my dressing and started to uh, investigate, um, Brock essentially exsanguinated on the operating room table. And it, it haunts me to this day. Um, Why is that? Why does that haunt you? Right. It haunts me because I don't know if I could have done anything more. I had just had breakfast with him that morning. Oh. Um you know, we, we had talked about, you know, um, you know, plans for after deployment, you know, stuff like that. Um, you know, I mean, Brock wasn't a team guy. He was, he was, he was a guy. He, he was a human being, you know, and he, we, we, you know, we just had a connection two humans in, 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 you know, the same shitty spot, yep. you know, just, just trying to make it through. And, you know, he for for him to be cut down like that, you know, in a non-combat event, uh, you know, it just it just it, it still doesn't sit right. And you know, if if I was able to have gotten on that bird, could I have done anything more? If if I was able to have you know gotten there, been there at the in, in the OR, and and you know, been able to communicate, you know, more clearly or or something with the surgeons, you know, maybe, maybe the outcome would have been different. I don't know. But, um, you know, whenever I hear that Aaron Lewis song, they call me doc. Um, you know, when, when it gets to the point in the song where, um, you know, when, when they're looking up at you in your eyes and, you know, you, you've got to tell them, Hey, everything's going to be okay. Um, even though you don't, you don't know. Um, you know, that, that, that hits hard, you know, and I'm really glad you, you talked about that. I mean, a lot of people who go down range never have to deal with that side of it. Uh, certainly not as with the responsibility of an 18 Delta. <clears throat> One of the things that comes to mind that you and I had talked about before we hit record is the impact on family. And I wonder, you know, like, how do you go back to a normal life after going through, you know, like it, you're, you wake up in an inferno. You have a guy die that you've been working with and, and knew personally. And then you go back and you're at a little league game or, you know, you're at a mall. How did, how did, what did that look like for you over these years? Not just deployments, but training, ex like you're always away. What's the impact to the family? Well, um, you know, I mean, I'll just preface it with, you know, everybody's story is different. You know, um, I, there's a lot of things that, you know, I, I, I compartmentalized, you know, I, I, I kind of, you know, put on a shelf, didn't deal with, didn't talk about, um, you know, whatever, um, you know, the, 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 the time away, the, the distance, um, you know, the, the inability to, you know, communicate on a, you know, regular yeah. basis. I mean, obviously as the, as, as the, the combat theaters developed, communication became a lot easier uh, back home. But, you know, the, the situations that, that you're put in, um, the, the things that, that you have to do, they, they take a psychological toll, whether you, you know it or not. And, you know, like, like we stated, you know, I've, I've, I've been 
married to my wife for, you know, this August, it'll be, um, you know, 21 years. Uh, our son now is, is 19 and a half. He'll be, he'll be 20, uh, this upcoming December. And, you know, if, if I'm going to be, you know, straight honest, um, you know, I, I don't really know my wife really anymore. Um, I, 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 I don't really know my son. Um, now that's not to say that, you know, I wasn't involved in, in activities. I mean, you know, um, I coached Pop Warner football for about six years, you know, while I was home. Um, it was a very competitive, very successful team. We made it to the Pop Warner Super Bowl uh, five years in a row. Uh, <laughs> you know, taking the, the first year that the that we went as an organization, um, you know, it was it was kind of like a, uh, you know, uh, a real realization moment, like, holy cow, like, wow, this is the deal. You know, we we didn't do too well. But, um, you know, that 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 second, third, fourth and fifth time that, that we went, we ended up taking, um, you know, uh, I think it was um, fifth, fourth, third and second in the entire nation. Um, you know, so it, it was really special. I mean, some of those kids have gone on to, um, you know, play D1 uh, football. Uh, one of them is actually uh, currently uh, the number 10 ranked, uh, safety in, in all of college football. Jeez. So it's really, really cool. Um, but you know, all, all that aside, you know, I, 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 I've never, I've, I've never really spoken, um, you know, uh, to my wife about, you know, a lot, a lot of the, uh, situations, a lot of the incidents, um, you know, I've, I've, I, I think maybe I've, I've talked to my son, you know, once or twice about it. Um, I've, I've never really, you know, shown them pictures um, or, or whatnot. And, you know, it, it created a rift. Um, and, you know, that, that rift, you know, is, is, has only grown over time. You know, I mean, these things don't go away. Um, and, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I had these visions of, you know, when when I retired from the military that, you know, hey, cool, you know, I'm going to be home, you know, dad's going to be here, your husband's here. Um, but, you know, it's 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 not it's not all, you know, sunshine yeah. and rainbows. It's not, um, you know, you. You know, you, you go from a, a career where you are you are absolutely engrossed you you are you are consumed by it and your 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 allostatic load gets elevated so high and you know I'll, you 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 can't just you know turn it off once once your allostatic load you know gets to that point you know you're not operating on a 1 to 10 scale you know you're you're at 15 all the time and that creates issues and you know so so what 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 do you do well what what i did was um you know i i, I looked at you know various organizations that were out there hiring our heroes uh was was an organization that i lashed up with and um i did a corporate fellowship uh with them as as part of my uh, my my retirement process and um, I was hired uh, by Amazon as a L6 operations uh, manager at uh, an AR, uh, Automated Robotic Sortable uh, Fulfillment Center uh, in Thornton, Colorado, north of Denver. And, um, you know, I, I jumped right into that. I mean, it's a, it's a very demanding job. Um, long hours, uh, a lot of stress, and a very steep learning curve. And... Um, you know, I, I did that for a year and a half at that location, and then I, I shifted down to the uh, Colorado Springs AR uh, Sortable uh, Fulfillment Center that they were launching um, in the um, essentially spring summer of uh, 2021, and uh, I I was there for a year. Um, you know, just. Oh focused on, focused on work, you know, yeah. filling that gap, you know, trying to find, 
you know, that, that purpose, that mission, you know, and, you know, in, in many regards, you know, I, I, I did find some satisfaction in the engagement with the associates, the, the ability to, you know, uh, engage with associates and identify their struggles, the, the barriers that they were encountering and, and serving to, you know, uh, ideate and, and develop solutions to, to resolve or mitigate the, the problems, you know, generate efficiencies uh, in, in the overall operation. And, and, you know, that's what I did. And then, um, you know, I, uh, last year, uh, last summer, um, I, I changed gears and, uh, I'm now with a telecommunications company, um, a very small group that's focused on, um, you know, the, the larger entity and accelerating pace, uh, and execution to plan, um, you know, identifying, um, uh, risks, jeopardies, uh, taking the, the, the raw data, distilling it into useful information and then gaining critical insights from that information. And, you know, it's, 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 it's valuable. It's beneficial, uh, yeah. work, but at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still dealing with the same issues of, of, you know, work-life balance, you know, um, creating that connection, uh, with, with my wife and son. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, when you leave the military, you know, you hope to have your family and, uh, you know, a lot of guys, um, they don't make it to the end of their careers with, with their, no. their spouse. especially um, in the community you come from, Ryan, you know, yeah. like that soft community, it's hard, extremely high divorce rate, um, you know, and, uh, extremely high suicide rates as well. Um, you know, 10th group doesn't have a very good reputation or track record, uh, when it comes to suicides. Um, my unit was, uh, had one of the highest suicide rates in the entire military. Um, but you know, by the grace of God, you know, I, I made it through, uh, everything and, you know, now, now I'm on the backside and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out some things. I'm, 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 um, uh, I'm, I'm you know, having some personal realizations, um, you know, of things that, you know, I effed up uh, and, and I need to make amends for. So, you know, it's uh, it's very much a work in progress, you know. I, I'd, I'd love to say that, hey, you know, I got a great story, you know, had an <laughs> awesome military career and, you know, then just flip the switch and, you know. Post. Went right back no. into you know, success and everything's, everything's rosy. Uh, no. But, you know, that's life. And that's, that's, um, you know, that's, it's part of the responsibility too. you know, to, to talk about these things and, you know, you know, get it out there that, you know, all, all the, all that machismo crap is, is crap. You know, um, at the end of the day, we're all people. And, you know, we, we've gone through some, some shit and you know you 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 have to unpack that you have to deal with it you have to confront it because it's not going to go away it's not going to get better over time it's not like a fine wine or fine cheese you know it just gets musty stinky and rotten so yeah it, so so many people i've talked to have a very similar experience where um you know tom satterley is one that comes to mind you know former delta operator who you know mentioned to me like doesn't talk to his son anymore. And, you know, many people have reached out to me, um, with this program and just mentioned like, Hey, um, you know, I had a son or daughter who served, we didn't really talk about anything. I now understand some of what, it, what they went through and, you know, like just hearing how you had to treat people. Like I'm, I'm sure that the people there on April 14th of 2005 are damn glad that it was Ryan that was there <laughs> treating them, you know, and as tough as it is to be away from your young son at the time, um, he's never going to hear that from them. Like they're all, they're in some other part of the world, yeah. you know, and like, you know, it, the guys you serve with know it, but we don't really connect that dot with the family so that they hear it. Um, it's something we don't do really well, but I hope that some of these stories, like if it's a family member listening, they hear this and they're like, holy shit, that's what they were like. They had F-16s flying over their head while I was watching American Idol at home. You know, it's a totally different experience. So 
Yeah, I mean, you said it so well. I, you know, I don't. I'm not trying to add anything here, but I just feel like you're definitely not alone in these feelings, man. Myself included. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, you know, it's. I mean, my my wife and son have heard, you know, a, a little bit here and there. Um, my last my last combat deployment um, was to Afghanistan. Um, I was, you know, obviously at that point, you know, in in higher levels. Uh, within the 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 battalion leadership structure and um i was heavily involved in in sensitive activities and special programs and um one of uh one of my really probably one of my best friends um he was a company sergeant major and uh, you know he, he it was it was our old company um and he wanted to you know show the guys that that, uh, you know, he still had it, that, you know, he could still operate. And so, you know, he made it a point, you know, it's, it's fairly common practice, you know, for leadership to go out on some ops with, with their, their ODAs and, and whatnot to, you know, see them, assess them, you know, just, you know, let them know, yeah. Hey, I'm here. I'm, I'm in the fight too. Like Jerry did with you, right. In Kosovo. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, so Ryan, um, lots of Ryan's here. Yeah. Um, Ryan, uh, Ryan was out, uh, you know, with, uh, the last team from, from the company and it just so happened to be our, our, our ODA that, you know, he and I had both been on, uh, previously, uh, you know, in Iraq for multiple rotations and, um, long story short, uh, Ryan was killed, uh, on that operation and it was, uh, you know, within within two weeks of when he was supposed to redeploy oh. and uh, you know a couple of weeks before that uh, he was he was in uh, Bagram uh, trying to go out on an op that didn't go he got you know waved off due to weather and uh, I, I brought him over to my compound uh, that I was responsible for and uh, you know he and I and um, my my right hand man my my NCOIC non commissioned officer in charge, um, you know we, you know we 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 spent the evening you know and well into the early hours of the night you know talking, you know about all the previous deployments all the, all the you know firefights and everything that we'd been involved in that we'd made it through, you know we were talking about you know retirement you know because you know we were both looking at retiring you know basically you know getting the wheels in motion after uh, that deployment, you know, we talked about our plans. We talked about our kids and, you know, all that crap. And, you know, then, then he was killed. And um, that was another really difficult moment. Um, speaking at, at uh, his memorial service there uh, in, at Mazari Sharif at Camp Stevenson. Um, it was uh it was uh, just a, a surreal moment, um, you know, because we'd known each other for so long, and I mean, his his uh, his wife and kids, you know, live, you know, about a five minute walk from my house. No and, way. And, hey, yeah, um, you know, my wife and his wife are are pretty good friends, and uh, they're actually going to be uh, my wife and son are are going with with um, her and. And uh, and her kids and, and some others to a uh, a gold star uh, retreat um, at the end of this month, actually uh, for Memorial Day. Uh, but you know, is that, that was that was probably one of the toughest things. And you know, I'm still dealing with that. Well, you know, after we redeployed, we um, very you know close close knit group uh, of us. We went down to uh, Texas to his hometown. And, uh, you know, we participated in a hometown ceremony and whatnot at his high school. Uh, and then, you know, kind of had, you know, a little um, memorial kind of party, uh, you know, afterwards, you know, with his childhood friends, you know, and, and stuff there and us. And, you know, we were we were all kind of trading stories and whatnot. And, you know, my my wife was there. Um and, you know, she was hearing some, some stories about, you know, him and, you know, stories about me got brought up and whatnot. And, you know, everybody was like, yeah, they're, 
Ryan, Ryan is a crazy mofo. Like that she only didn't... knows you as the guy at home, right? Right. You know, and yeah. you know, it's, it's, um, you know, I, I don't know, you know, that's, that's, that's the struggle, you know, how, yeah. how do I, how do I package that up, you know, into, into a narrative that, that is acceptable. That is, you know, something that, that, you know, she or my son could digest and understand and, you know, whatever. I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it's never going to take away from the time lost. It's never going to, you know, yeah. fully patch things up, but, you know, you know, generate that understanding, that awareness to be, be able to take those, those positive steps forward. Man, that's, that's tough, right? I can't even imagine at the end of your career, this guy you grew up with, like <laughs> throughout, throughout your time and, and then to lose him at the end, man. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, God, I'm sorry to hear that. I mean, it was a profound loss, you know, yeah. for, you know, not just the, you know, the tight knit group, um, but, you know, for the, for the whole unit for, yeah. um, I mean, because, you know, Ryan was an extremely well-respected leader, uh, an extremely well-respected operator and, you know, just all around, you know, great human being, Yeah, you know, that a lot of, a lot of people looked up to. So Ryan, I'm going to get you out of here in just a bit, man. I got two questions I ask everybody. Um, yeah. First one is um, when you were downrange, is there anything that you carried with you that had sentimental value, something that somebody gave you that you just wanted to have on you while you're outside the wire? So, yeah, there were a couple of things. Um, so I remember my son, um, shoot, he, he must've been like, I don't know, maybe five years old or so. Um, he uh, he liked Legos. I mean, he still likes Legos, but he gave me he gave me this small little Lego, you know, uh, pistol, and he was like, "Hey, you know, here you go, Dad. And, you know, this this will keep you safe." And oh uh, you know, it, it kind of chokes me up. You know, now oh, man, it's choking me uh, up. <laughs> well, um, you know, there there was that, and then um, another thing that uh, that I carried uh, with me. Uh, from from my the end of my first deployment, uh, I carried it on every single every single op every 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 everything that I did uh, from that point forward until I retired. Um, so from you know 2005 to 2020, um, there was a flag, the, uh, an American flag. Actually, it's this one right here. This American flag that is tightly bound and in zip ties. I carried on my back. It was, it was, it was on our wall in our team house when we got blown up on April 14th of 2005 and it survived and I took it off the wall and I rolled it up like that. And then I put it right on the back of my body armor and it, it, it did not leave my body armor or my person. Uh, until I had to take my body armor apart to turn it in when I was retiring. That's and, uh, a great one. I have that. I have that flag sitting, um, basically, right, um, you know, on my one of my work computer screens with my um, my bracelets. Um, yeah, for people who are listening and can't see, I mean, you've got a stack of them, basically. Yeah. Um, well, you know, these, these aren't all of them, but, um, they, they comprise five, um, close friends, um, that, uh, that are no longer with us. And, um, you know, I, I, I keep that flag there and I keep those bracelets there in, in, in view because they're consistent reminders that no matter what I'm going through, it can always get worse. Yeah. God, man. And that, you know, um, you know, I got to put things in perspective, you know, and, you know, not everything's a problem. You know, there, there are, there are problems and there are inconveniences and, I need to be 
cognizant of that and remind myself that, hey, don't feel sorry for yourself. You know, you, you're you're doing all right. And, you know, if you really think it, it, it's bad, it can always get worse. Yeah. So appreciate what you have. Appreciate where you're at. And, you know, one foot in front of the other every day, positive steps. The last thing that I ask everybody here, Ryan, is uh, as you look back, you, you spent a long time in some tough places uh, in the soft community and made it out with your family, which is remarkable. Um, and I know you said there's nothing special here, but we didn't even delve into the medals, which I'm sure there are plenty of. Yeah. Uh, but this is not the what I experienced by any means. It's special, you know, certainly from from my vantage point. But I would just ask you as you look back on that time knowing what you know now, would you go back and do that again? 100%. I mean, you know, if not me, who? Yeah. Man. You know, I mean, you know, it, we, we all have choices in life. You know, we, I mean, you know, there, there's that, that famous Walt Whitman, you know, poem, you know, and I took the path less traveled. And that has made all the difference. Um, you know, it's not for everybody. Um, it's 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 not it's it's not the glamorous you know crap you see in the movies and and whatever. Um, you know, yeah, there's there's a lot of really cool cool things that happen. Um, but you know, yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent. I mean, you know, the the physical stuff that I'm dealing with now. Um, you know, on the backside the you know, dealing with the, you know, psychological trauma for, for lack of a better term, uh, you know, coming to grips with that, all that aside, I mean, yeah, I, I, I probably would, would do it again with, with, without question. Um, because I feel that it was important. I feel that it was valuable. Um, and you know, I've, I don't know what else I would have done. Yeah. You know, quite frankly, you know, I hear you. Oh man. Yeah. I know there are a lot of people and families who are happy that you did what you did too. Cause they got loved ones alive today, man. Ryan, thank you so much for the time, man. I got to give Daryl just so much, so, I'm just so grateful um, that he connected us um, and that we had that, you know, impromptu connection through LinkedIn. So thanks for the time, man. I'm just so appreciative of, of these stories and insights. Thank you. I, re I really appreciate it. And, you know, I, 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 I hope that, you know, at least one person can, you know, take something from this of value and, um, you know, benefit from it. For sure. I know that will. I hope you enjoyed this combat story. I am still amazed at the experiences that people have. I have not come across a single person who doesn't have some Hollywood story, and this was no exception from Ryan. I thought, based on having just heard from a Green Beret, I'd look at a couple comments from uh, one of our previous Green Beret episodes, and this one was with Jeff Adamek, who some will recall a third Special Forces group, not a 10th group guy like Ryan, a third Special Forces group um, from about three months ago. And the first one is from Lisa Del Toro, a subscriber on our YouTube channel. And Lisa says, I've been watching your podcast for a year now. I've not been in the military, nor do I know anyone in the military. I'm just a Vegas housewife, but I am addicted to hearing these stories of truly fascinating, brave, and heroic people. It's a true eye-opener for the average person. Also, I just have to say, you Got a great voice, great hair, LOL, and a perfect decorum for a podcast. You were meant to do this. My husband and I are diehard fans. I am super appreciative of this, Lisa. Any pilot will tell you they love to get complimented on their great hair, so it means a lot to me. But just reading this, I was so surprised. Obviously, you know, you've heard probably heard me mention this once or twice. The, uh, the number of women who listen to this is growing, but still a very small percentage of the overall uh, listener population. And the fact that you don't have anyone in the military is super interesting to me. So I'm 
beyond grateful that you spend time listening to uh, folks like us talk about these crazy experiences that we had and that it means something to you and uh, and your husband. Really appreciate you all being subscribers and sticking with us for over a year now. Thank you. And the next one is from another YouTube subscriber, also on the Jeff Adamek interview. And this is G Peralta says, haha, I absolutely love the part where he went and grabbed the Oakleys. The fact that guy basically said, F these Oakleys, I almost died and launched them totally makes sense. Um, for those who, who haven't listened to this episode, basically after a pretty serious engagement, Jeff helps this guy get out of the kill zone and the guy I guess had left his Oakley so Jeff goes back gets him gives him to the guy and the guy just chucks him but Jeff had to go back into the line of fire basically to get him um, and it's just a very you know something that just happens over a few seconds and with all the emotions and insanity that's going on this is so common uh, with what goes on downrange so glad that glad it landed with you uh, G Peralta and then you just went on there was another comment that you made here that said uh, can't believe how well he speaks seems very intelligent on everything he talks about and he's hilarious this guy is great awesome interview and jeff is um like I, I remember him just talking about some of the weapon systems he employed i felt like i was sitting through a super interesting class on some of these uh, just so much knowledge so yeah I, I i felt the same and then lastly a couple five star reviews on apple first is from Poor boy 81 he says awesome love the show first listener dedicated listener from now on and then another five star review from loco breath says okay i guess because you've got a pretty good show for a gun bunny ha <laughs> keep up the good work sir scouts out and this is some um, inside ribbing that we do within the aviation community in the army so scout pilot would be somebody who flew uh flew kiowas i guess now lakotas um also apaches are getting into the scout world to some degree but there was always this uh healthy fun professional tension between gun bunnies as we were called the apache drivers and the scouts the kiowa pilots um, and as many of you have heard me say i have an older brother who is a kiowa pilot so we uh we always take an opportunity to take shots at one another when, when we get together so thank you for those five star reviews as i mentioned before that helps us get these stories to more people so it means a ton thank you all for listening this far if you've made it you are uh courageous uh, listeners you stay safe y'all <laughs>